button off or mute your cell phones or other devices. And uh, I will ask Trustee Lanfear. She probably did lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, Rob, could you do the quorum check? Certainly. A um, couple special meetings in April, April 25th. I think we had polled and everyone was available for that date. Um, and then April 30th, there's also a special meeting scheduled. Um, May 7th, regular meeting, which will um, begin with the current council and then we'll have the swearing in for the new trustee. Okay. April 25th is Thursday, Yes, it is a Thursday. Yep. Okay. All right, we will open it up to public comment. If anyone has any comment you would like to offer on any item that is not on the agenda, please step forward. Hi, Ted. Hey. Step on up. Hi, Ted Winchenko. So yes, I have a comment not on the agenda. I'd like to go back to last week's study session. You know, I just, you know, expressed my disappointment that, again, we're doing improvements and not considering the possible small things we can do to mitigate stormwater. And when I said that, the, what I heard back, or one of the things I heard back, was that, well, that Kenilworth's experience hasn't been as good as they would have hoped. And so I was intrigued by this, and so I spoke with Kenilworth, and I actually also spoke with the village engineer in Oak Park, where they installed, you know, like $1.5 million worth of green alleyway. And so in Kenilworth, apparently they are very happy with their system. The only issue that it's mitigated the problem that it was trying to solve, it's working just fine, the residents in that area, instead of having permeable pavers, which is what the village proposed, wanted asphalt. And mm -hmm. so asphalt, just like a permeable asphalt, permeable concrete, you know, they're basically made with less glue and, you know, about the same amount of rock. And so they don't hold together as well. And it seems that, like, where people are turning their driveways, there's a lot of sh lateral shear on that surface, and it's, and it's raveling sooner than they would have thought. So they're going to deal with that. But overall, it's not a failure. It seems like they're solution has been a success and it's still working. And more than that, you know, Oak Park installed, you know, like $1.5 million worth of, of green alleyways back in 2013. And, you know, I, I called just because I was curious and, I, and they're working just like they would hope. And, you know, clearly their cost was a little bit more and they were doing certain things and where they put them. But the point is, is that I think these technologies are in fact proven. And it's a, again, I just am a little disappointed that we aren't considering these things as we make, you know, infrastructure improvements. Okay, I just wanted to touch on that because, you know, I... Thanks, Ted, and we'll definitely be talking about that more. Uh, any, anybody else? Okay. Uh, we will now move on to a presentation from Nutrier students, Mary Balos and Allison Ellie. Am I saying that right? Yes, okay. Well, come on up. Uh, you have the podium, and you're going to be giving a presentation about composting. Yes. Okay. Is there a way for us to project our position here? So I'm going to plug that. I don't want to mess it up. And just for everybody in the audience, this isn't the compost that comes out of the village council. It's the village. Yeah. And I'm Mary Bayless, and I'm a junior. And we're actually in a program called the Integrated Global Study School, IGSS. IGSS is a really self-directed program where we're allowed to like study really kind of more what we want and like a lot of our passions. And so we've been pretty much focusing all year on um, composting and environmental issues and just things that we thought were important to us. And today we wanted to talk to you guys about village wide <coughs> composting in Winnetka. So our first point is that why does composting matter? And we believe composting matters because it's a much more sustainable way to deal with waste. Um, global warming is a really big issue, and to make something useful out of all of our waste, um, composting would be a good way to not 
like it pollutes the landfills. And then composting really reduces the garbage volume because you're taking like millions of pounds of waste that you food waste that would be going to the landfill and instead putting it back into the earth to help to sustainably improve gardens and farms instead of using like um, chemical fertilizers you can just use natural fertilizers and you can water your plants less um so why is food waste an issue in general well about a third of food produced is wasted and if food waste were its own country it would be the third largest third largest producer of greenhouse gas emissions, which is a huge contributor to climate change. And in the US alone, about $1 trillion worth of food is wasted each year. And so as all that is wasted, it's a really great opportunity to utilize composting and get something out of a waste product we already have. So 30 to 50% of landfill waste can potentially be composted so why aren't we utilizing a service that only benef that not only benefits our planet, but it benefits like just our daily lives? And so why do we care about this like personally? Just as young people, we really care about the planet and the future of the planet, and we think that um, landfilling all of this food, like as we talked about, is all the food waste in Winnetka is a waste when it's really such a simple cost-effective solution to implement a form of village-wide composting. And it would really keep Winnetka sustainable and progressive on that front. And just we just think it's really important to So we are proposing um, a village that a village-wide composting plan to be implemented. And this could go a couple of different ways. And today we're going to talk about some of the viable options that could be utilized separately or in conjunction with each other. So the first one we want to talk about was a ride-along or curbside program. And this could be offered by Lakeshore that currently does Winnetka's recycling or the village staff that currently picks up trash weekly. Um, and it would be seasonal and it would be picked up with yard waste. And a lot of other villages nearby, well met, I think Glencoe have seasonal pickup with yard waste. And people are including, like seasonally you can include food scraps in that to be picked up. And it's actually, Depending on your provider, whether you use Lakeshore or the village staff, um, whoever you're using and where that those food scraps are going, it, it, it's limited in what you can compost. Like if it's only food scraps, paper products, what types of food, meat, dairy, all that sort of thing. So that is one option. But um, we do know that Winnetka uses Lakeshore for recycling in order to use and in order to use Lakeshore for composting as well you'd have to switch the trash pickup over to Lakeshore, but the trash pickup is currently done by Public Works, and so that's like kind of a big shift. So our next option would sort of eliminate shifting the Public Works people. So our next um, option is a bucket pickup program, and uh, compost collection bins would be provided to uh, participating residents through Collective Resource. Collective Resource is a like composting company run by a um, resident of Evanston and she this lady runs Evan all of Evanston's composting and she works with the public works but she collects it all herself and uh, the each bucket pickup would be 625 per bucket weekly or 1025 per bucket if you buy if you get it picked up bi-weekly and that's and, covered by um, the residents. yeah by the residents so the residents would pay just like they pay for the, like trash pickup or recycling and we understand that village-wide composting for residents is more of a difficult to set up because Winneka would need to switch to Lakeshore for the trash pickup as well. So this is a good option on its own or used to fill the seasonal gap with the uh, previous option, the ride-along program. And so then the next is sort of, the next option would sort of be like a plan that we kind of devised on our own and that is a community compost program, kind of like a smaller scale of um, residential composting, and that would be five to ten compost collection bins put in different public facilities around Winnetka, like the Village Hall, Public Works Building, the Library, Winnetka Schools, the Winnetka Community House, even though that's not the village, um, they have expressed interest in composting recently, and those could be picked up either by Lakeshore, if you choose to go that route, or Collective Resource, does these bins as well, and we think that this would be a really great option 
to get people involved in composting that may not want to do it on their own or um, may not be super open to it at first because having the bins in public facilities would be a great part of like, a great way to like integrate it into the city without forcing everyone to do it in their homes, which is also sort of coincidentally how recycling became such a norm. And then we also want to talk about zero waste events um, because Winnetka hosts the music, Winnetka hosts the Selma Music Festival, Fall Fest, the festival on 4th of July, and for the cost of about $24, they, um, these different events can utilize a compost pickup, like just for one, like kind of like a pop-up just for one time for the event, where all the food scraps and paper products used at the event can be collected and composted. And so that's sort of like as those events go on, but if we did the like five to 10 compost collection bins around Winnetka, they did five, they were picked up what, once every two weeks, that would cost the village about $180 a month, which doesn't seem like very much for a really great program. So um, all of these products listed up here and many more are compostable, so it's not just food scraps that can be composted, and this will be like removing so many pieces of waste from our landfills and putting them back into the environment. And so just talk about public support. We, we, have, we went to um, Go Green Wilmette and presented there in March. And we sent out a petition um, asking people in Winnetka if they would be on board with some type of village-wide composting. And we have about um, 230, 240 signatures from people in Winnetka that are in favor of village-wide composting in some form. And um, there probably would be more. We did it through a Google form, which not everyone could totally figure out. But it was pretty successful as um, it went, and we have all the signatures here. So we are asking that the village commits to researching and implementing a village-wide composting plan that makes sense for Winnetka. And thank you so much for your time. We just hope that you can consider this as an option because as we were saying, like the options we presented could be used like in conjunction with each other, um, or separately, or just there are a lot of different ways to go about starting a composting program for the village of Winnetka, and we think that it's a really important thing to consider. And so, yeah. I can to see if anyone. Um, thank you. <laughs> That's <was> off. <laughs> Um, that was really well done. Uh, would any trustees like to ask any questions? If you don't mind, you probably weren't expecting that, but um, Nutria called and they said we should do like a test. <laughs> I, I actually have the first, I have the first 25 questions and then we'll just pass. We've been on Google yeah. all day long. Yeah, we've got a little, and there's an essay at the end also. Um, so, uh, so I run the Music Fest and we've been looking at composting this year. Uh, but we need somebody to help run it. So are you interested in helping out? Yeah, I would do. Okay, so don't leave until I get your email addresses. Okay. So you're now part of the Music Fest. Good. Congratulations. Um, and you get a T-shirt. <laughs> Can I just ask a couple of just practical questions? Thank you for the presentation. That was terrific. Um, but we have a lot of people here that might be interested in this, and if we did a program, might be part of that program. Um, so the ride along curbside program, it's seasonal. Tell me what you mean by seasonal. Well, in Wilmette currently they have, they've just started and I think in the past year, or this is the first year, where they're doing a seasonal program April through November where okay. once a week um, yard waste is being picked up. <clears throat> and you can like, put your food, question. you put your food scraps, like they, I think they have yard waste Bin. I don't know if they use bags or bins, but however they do it is you put only, for them it's only food scraps because it's harder with the companies that they're using to use like other like paper, paper products. products. So they just take like the, the grass, the leaves, the branches, and then the food, any food waste that you have in your house. Okay. In, in a separate? All together. All together. All together. You're able to put All that together. into the yard waste bin that's picked up weekly. And a lot of like one of the ways you would go about that like logistically in your home is you can buy compost collection bins for your counter and how we do it at my house at least is you just put all the scraps 
you would just put the food scraps into the bin that sits on your counter, it's like a little trash bin, mm -hmm. and as it fills up, you just dump it into the compost bin that gets picked up. Okay, okay. And then um, if, all right, so our, our yard waste pickup would do that, not the garbage collection? So yard waste has been collected separately <laughs> since about 1990. Yeah. Um, since we handle the, the yard waste, we have a, a permit to handle just yard waste transfer at our yards. It's not permitted for food scraps uh, or food composting, so that's something that we would have to follow up We'd on if up. this was to be combined with yard waste composting. Um, Northfield also does a, res, uh, a seasonal one, April 1 through December, uh, and I believe it's a separate container for food scraps. Okay. And then the, what you're doing at home with, with the bucket right now, anyone can do that, correct? I mean, anyone can contact this Evanston yes. company and do that. So anyone who was interested here could get that information. That could be a village encouraged initiative, yes. if you will, as opposed to a village run yes. initiative. Okay. Um, collective resource, so they have a partnership with Evanston where the village encourages their citizens to use the service and because the village encourages that collective resource of every pickup is a discount of a few dollars or like 50% off. And so we were like sort of thinking that using that program um, that the village of Winnetka could either incentivize or promote that somehow through collective resource that would give the people of Winnetka a discount right. when they're using the service. Okay, good, thank you. Um, once again, thank you, because this is an issue we've been looking at for a while. Trustee Myers led a study, how many years ago? Three. Three. So we've been thinking about this for a while. So thank you, because you guys did additional research to help us out. So um, um, my question is, I don't know if you looked into or have any insight in terms of um, potential pitfalls. Um, for example, with just our regular recycling, obviously contaminated um, product is, you know, that is becomes unusable. And I wondered if you had any information about difficulties, things that we need to think about um, to try to overcome if we were to start this uh, from, from the get-go. Yeah. So talking to the founder of Collective Resource, she did express a lot of, not a lot, but some concern with um, the community compost program, if there were bins and public places around Winnetka with contamination, and one of the things she said is that as long as she's been running the business collective resource, she said that there hasn't really been a problem with people putting bins in public places like schools, libraries, village hall, but you do run into issues if those bins are like, because originally we were thinking, well, you could think of bins as parks, or parks, beaches, like different places like that, and she was like, well, if there's, if they're not in a building, there's risk of contamination. Right. And that is another thing that would be difficult using. Um, switching over to Lakeshore, there's a much more limited list of things that you can compost, like residentially or commercially. Um, and so that's why we, I mean, there, but there are services like collective right. resource right. that can take almost anything that can be composted. And for example, the zero waste events like the music festival, um, if you were to use compostable like paper products, mm -hmm. Collective Resource actually has like a list on their website of specific things that they okay for you to use that can be composted in there. So there are definitely, um, like you said, like contamination, especially with recycling, is like definitely one of the pitfalls. But there are ways you can like minimize that and avoid it. And um, just to follow up on that, in terms of the types of food scraps, is it? Any type of food, I mean, including meat and oils and things like that, or is it only vegetable? On, it depends on the who's taking it. I, I'm sorry, I should have um, been clear. Relative to um, if it would be seasonal, would that just be vegetable scraps, or is that anything? And then um, Collective Resources has a. Again, it does depend on who's picking it up, whether right. it's the Winnetka Public Works people right. who currently do the trash pickup, whether it's Lakeshore, whether it's Collective Resource. Um, like we said, Collective Resource, they have like a very comprehensive list of things you can compost. Pretty much everything that was once living, including meat, dairy, all sorts of things. Um, I know through a company like Lakeshore, it is a little bit more limited in like paper products you can compost. Sometimes and some meats. services. Certain company, certain companies won't take meat. Right. So only vegetable, yeah. and vegetable products. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just again and right. 
we'll just we'll sweep you right into service. So thank you very much. I really appreciate the presentation. It's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And we're going to be having a lot more conversation about this. So thank you. This is really helpful for us. All right. Okay. <laughs> Make sure he gives you a t-shirt at least. Um, why don't we uh, do reports? Um, we'll start with trustee reports. Penny? Bob? Nope. Scott, any reports? No. <laughs> All right. Uh, village manager? Uh, no comprehensive report this evening, but I would just say we're keeping an eye on Springfield in terms of the legislation they, that may be coming out of. Uh, of the legislature. Some of it is positive and some of it is concerning. Um, specifically, uh, lead water service lines is an issue that could be a, a significant unfunded mandate. And then we're keeping a close eye on um, legalized recreational cannabis and how, that and how that is regulated at the local level versus what the state's proposing. Can I ask a question on sure. that? Sure. Yeah. Does, does Winneka currently have any ordinances about uh, uh, medical marijuana? No. 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 So one, if one were interested, they could open a medical marijuana. Subject to the restrictions of the state, which Peter, you can help me this right. uh, with, you know, but locations, there's no schools separate, and parks. Right. Um, no are, separate. Uh, I, okay. Actually, I would say that that we would, the council would have to take action to allow medical marijuana because it's not a per permitted, permitted use, use in so the village. Use. It, would it would be whatever the village wanted it to be, but it would require an amendment to the zoning code. But looking at our commercial districts, there are inherent um, uh, distance limitations because there's schools and churches in almost each district to some extent, and it has to be a certain amount of distance from those activities. Village attorney, did I ask no you? Report. No report. And, okay. Uh, and I have no report. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to approval of the agenda. Does any trustee wish to remove an item on the consent agenda for a separate vote? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the final form of the agenda? Second. Second. Voice vote? Aye. All right. I'll turn it over to Rob to read this thing. Sure. Um, con consent agenda approval of Village Council meeting minutes for April 4th, 2019, regular meeting. Approval of the warrant list dated March 29th through April 11th, 2019, in the amount of $415,415.53. Resolution number R36, 2019, approving the purchase of a Horton ambulance and striker power load system for adoption. Resolution number R40, 2019, purchase of a police patrol vehicle. Resolution number R41, 2019, waiving bidding and approving change order number six to the contract with BMAX Incorporated for electrical distribution system work. Resolution number R42, 2019, approving an easement agreement for the maintenance of utilities at Indian Hill Club. Resolution number R44, 2019, purchase of a televising truck software updates. Resolution number R45, 2019, approving an easement agreement for the maintenance of a water main at 70 and 77 Indian Hill Road, and outdoor seating permit for Edelheides of Winnetka LLC. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda by omnibus vote? So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Trustee Dearborn? Yes. Trustee Myers? Yes. Trustee Lamphere? Yes. Trustee Wedner? Yes. And Trustee Kripe, I'm sorry, you get to vote. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, all right. Uh, ordinance number MC2-2019, Plan Development Amendments. Uh, this item is being, uh, so this was presented at the April 4 rescheduled council meeting. A public hearing on the Plan Development Amendment Ordinance was continued until April 16. And tonight we're uh, missing Trustee Swark and President Rintz. And given that fact, this hearing is continued until Thursday, April 20, the Thursday, April 25th, public special meeting. But, uh, but if anybody in the audience is here to speak on this issue tonight, uh, you can step up. What was that? We'll, we'll, we'll go backwards on that. How's that sound? We'll go like beep, you know, we'll just, we'll do one of those deals. But um, so how about on the uh, 
plan development. Okay, we're good. Penny, you had a question? No. Okay. All right. Um, Backtracking is allowed, right? Yep. Okay, the village attorney says we can go back. So we would very much like to hear a comment from the public about the composting. Thank you. So I'm, I'm Melissa Mizell from 939 Tower Road, and I'm here to support and commend the presentation and, and the girls who are trying hard to turn Winnetka into a wonderful uh, Illinois national and global citizen. I think it's great. I um, want to bring <laughs> a middle-aged perspective to this proposition. Um, composting is wonderful uh, for the earth, and it's not... Um, the most desirable thing a homeowner does. Like, it's like not on anybody's list of favorite things to do. Like, you know, we've been composting since we moved to Winnetka in like 96. And, um, like, just to use a technical term, it's yucky. Okay? Like, that thing that got buried, like, behind the bag of onions and you can hardly recognize it. Like, Mother Nature wants us to be, like, disgusted by that and to, like, get it out of sight as quickly as possible. And so I think the question for the council is, what logic do we employ when we're keeping glass and magazines and things like, you know, plastics out of our waste stream? And does it make sense to employ that same logic when we're trying to keep biological stuff, uh, with, you know, bulky and methane producing out of our waste stream? Because just as a human being, um, there's, it takes much more diligence to separate organic waste from everything you're tossing into the trash than it does to take, you know, like newspapers aren't disgusting and neither are Coke cans. So, if you think, yes, this is something we want to do, then what I particularly urge you not to do is charge people extra to behave what you consider virtuously. Remove obstacles, like extra cost, rather than adding obstacles, which will only serve to make this like a niche behavior. You know, like you might take a macrame class with a park district, you might pay X many dollars a week to compost. It, I urge you to um, not be a copycat of other villages and say, well, they get their people to pay $8 a week, we might as well charge $8 a week, but to consider what are we really trying to achieve and act in concert with that thinking and the other recyclables logic. Thanks so much. Thank you. Any other comment on, on the composting item? Yeah. I'm, I'm Liz Kunkel, uh, and uh, I have a, I had no, a couple other people who came to make public comment about composting, um, but weren't able to stay. And um, so I just want to sort of represent for them, but also tell a quick anecdote. I've been working on composting for a while in the village with schools, with the village, with individuals, with anybody who's interested in talking about it, honestly, or not interested in talking about it. But I wanted to relay an anecdote of how easy it is to implement sometimes um, at the um, uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, recognition lunch last week. There were 275 people. It was a plated event. And um, a few weeks prior, Terry Dason said, I could help get composting going for that event. And I spoke with the um, director of facilities at the community house. It happened to be the Friday before spring break. We walked away with our plans. I went on spring break, and I forgot all of my plans. And nothing happened. And then a week after spring break, I was like, oh, no, I was going to do that. And it was now five days away from the event. So fast forward to Monday, 48 hours before the event. I, in half an hour, three phone calls, three people saying yes, and half an hour later, we got a composting through the bucket system through Collective Resource in Evanston set up for the um, recognition lunch. And we captured approximately 24 gallons of waste for an absolute pure cost of $24. It was a one-time pickup. 
That was an easy event. It was in the kitchen because it was plated. It wasn't out. It wasn't public. Um, that makes it super easy to manage. But the cost, it's so minimal. It just needs to be thought about in advance. Um, and if I may, the bucket system has provided a really nice um, fill-in for the ride-along. So for what it's worth, I am really an advanced beginner in all of this. I am learning as I go. The ride-along system uh, of compost, the sort of a curbside system, is seasonal precisely because it's picked up with landscape waste. And also because it's picked up with landscape waste, it tends to be more limited in what's collected. It's more fruits and vegetables, scraps, maybe not paper, definitely not meat products, dairy products, things like that. The bucket system is totally comprehensive. It's everything that was once alive. It's all food. It's all things that arguably aren't food, like candy and snacks and things that are unusually orange and you know, weird, like Cheetos. I mean, <laughs> things that are not naturally occurring in nature. You can still compost that, but you have to mix it with the landscape waste to make it happen. It actually all ends up at the same place. It's just where you collect it and how it's collected, sort of at the point of collection that makes the difference. And what an interesting thing that's happened recently is that the collective resource bucket system in Evanston, she's actually entered into a franchise agreement with the city of Evanston to provide her service in addition to the ride along. And she provides what's called a gap service during the winter months when the seasonal program isn't available at all. So she's really filling some needs and she services these zero waste events. And again, she helped put this chamber uh, event together very quickly. And she's now partnering with the catering, uh, one of the catering uh, companies that works with the community house, as well as the community house directly to say, to any organization that's coming in to do an event that might not use their preferred caterer, here's how easily you can implement one of these systems. So again, I obviously echo the, the girl's sentiment to, to figure out a system that works for Winneka, because I think there are lots of options that can. So thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? OK. Um, oh, we got one. No, we don't have one. <laughs> Um, we will move on to uh, resolution number R37, 2019, approving a banquet and reception hall at 915 Green Bay Road. Uh, and this is up for public hearing and discussion. On March 19, a public hearing for proposed banquet and reception hall in the Hubbard Woods Business District was continued. The hearing will reopen tonight to allow public input on the issue of allowing the facility as a permitted use. The council will then take time to study whether such uh, whether future such facilities should be permitted or a special use. Uh, so David is here to review this for us. Uh, Go sure. away. Uh, good evening. So uh, there are a number of items um, that the council would need to take action on regarding this request uh, from a, a zoning relief issue to uh, creation of valet um, parking regulations and any fees associated with that, and then as well as uh, liquor uh, license requirements um, in terms of creating a new classification and granting the liquor license. So uh, tonight we're going to um, present these documents and uh, listen to the council's discussion after you hear from the public. Uh, the one item that does require a public hearing is the zoning relief that you'll be considering um, on, on the banquet facility, and that's what you will be holding this evening. But again, you can take public comment on any of these items. So the subject property at 915 Green Bay Road is on the east side of Green Bay Road between Tower and Gage Street. It's the former antique emporium space to give you reference and it's been vacant for approximately six years. Uh, the first floor um, is around 9,000 square feet of usable space and then there's a second floor uh, that had been used um, as office space which is about 950 square feet uh, which the applicant uh, would plan um, to also use that space in addition to the first floor space. Uh, the property is currently zoned C2 General Retail and along the frontage uh, C2 Commercial Overlay District. Uh, this designation is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, neither zoning district currently uh, specifically calls out a banquet facility as an allowed use. Um, 
both districts do allow uh, specialty food and beverage shops and standard restaurants and the C2 district in which where uh, the catering facility would be located um, does allow catering facilities. So to summarize uh, the proposal, uh, there's three major components, um, a food specialty store cafe, which is the yellow area, then there'd be the, the bank with um, venue facility, the reception and seating area, and then the catering and storage, which is the blue area uh, towards the rear. And as I said, the applicant would also use about 950 square feet on the second floor. Uh, a brief overview of each of the operations, and I'll let the applicant go into the, the uniqueness of each of these. Uh, the cafe uh, specialty food shop uh, would be along the street. Um, she's showing it between 900 and 950 square feet. Um, as we'll talk later, she's willing to com commit to a minimum of uh, providing at least 750 square feet. Um, she would offer an assortment of food items along with beverage items, including uh, beer and wine for dine-in as well as retail to go. Uh, she's looking at being open initially uh, several days a week and would be willing to commit to a minimum of five days a week um, for a minimum of eight hours a day. So as you will recall, the last time the council reviewed this request, uh, she. Uh, had eliminated that. She has now put that back in. Uh, there would be seating for 15 to 20 guests, and she anticipates three to four employees to serve that portion of the facility. Uh, the second part is the, the banquet or venue hall, um, approximately 4,500 square feet. Again, to be conservative, she'd be willing to commit to a minimum of 4,000 for this area. Um, this area would have regular um, weekend events, wedding, showers, uh, birthday parties, and similar events. Uh, there would also be some during the week, including uh, a few multi-day meetings, conferences, uh, which she um, currently has experiences about 10 a year. Um, in her current facility, and again, as she moves from her current location to the new location, she'll have to explore those opportunities more um, here on the North Shore. Um, there would be access from Green Bay Road to get into this area. Um, some events would occur until midnight. We'll talk a little more about that later. And uh, seating would be for up to 150 guests, including a dancing area. And she anticipates when this facility is up and operating, there'd be eight to 25 employees, depending upon the size of the event. And then the rear area uh, consists of the, the kitchen preparation area, uh, some storage and office space. Uh, deliveries would occur. Um, off the stock area at the rear of the building. Um, and this catering kitchen would serve the banquet facility as well as the cafe. David, is, is that dock area indoors or outdoors? It's outdoors. But it's, it's recessed in the back where the area That's what I was just, yeah. So, yeah. so it's recessed back. It's recessed. Back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when the council last spoke about this, uh, parking and noise were considerations. Um, just have gathered some information in terms of parking uh, in the Hubbard Woods uh, district. Uh, there are around 340 off-street parking spaces located in the Hubbard Woods or Scott Avenue parking deck, um, as well as at the Tower and Green Bay uh, surface lot, and then uh, behind uh, the buildings um, on the east side of Green Bay, there's a parking area referred to as Tower Court. Um, in addition to those 340 spaces, there's 180 um, on-street spaces on uh, the public street of Green Bay Road, Merrill and Gage, and then the street that goes around Hubbard Woods Park. Uh, there's more detailed information in terms of the uh, limitations on these parking areas. 
um, in the staff report. Some of these areas are reserved for permit holders for certain periods of the day. Others are for public parking. Um, and, and that information in more detail is included in your re report. Um, uh, we, we did, we had heard some concerns about uh, the parking deck in particular. Uh, so we went out and took a, a few parking counts um, on a Saturday afternoon and evening, as well as during the week on a Thursday midday um, to look at uh, the usage of those uh, parking spaces. Um, as you can see, the yellow, or I'm sorry, the green represents uh, parking spaces areas that are 50% or less occupied. Uh, the yellow is 50 to 75% um, occupied, and then over 75% occupied are the, the red areas. Um, uh, and so you can see um, during these days that there, there was capacity, um, more so during certain times and certain days. Um, um, within the Hubbard Woods District. Um, this is trying to create a summary table uh, in terms of where are there parking spaces that are unrestricted in terms of day and time. So for the applicant uh, banquet facility, uh, they tend to uh, be longer than our typical 90 or two hour um, time limits. And so um, if there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, if there is a, a block, black box in one of those squares or rectangles, I should say, um, that means there's, there is a time limit um, so that someone cannot spend an extended amount of time in those areas. So on a weekday, uh, there are a few areas after 10.30 a.m. where there are no time limits and someone from the public could go and park there with no limit, but that doesn't happen until 10.30 in the morning. So if an event was occurring at the banquet facility at nine, um, they couldn't park there because um, there are limits, permit holder limits um, on those spaces. In the evenings, as you can see, it's much more open in terms of uh, there aren't limits. And then on the weekends, um, there are also fewer limits on the restriction on, on parking for those who want to park for an extended period of time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so the applicant's parking needs, as she described, um, the employees um, she's indicated would take public transportation or she would secure employee parking passes from the village to park in village employee lots. Um, the food shop and cafe would be similar to any retail business or other restaurant in terms of the customers would look for on-street parking or off-street parking in lots when they're available. In terms of the banquet facility, um, again, the weekday event between 8 and 6 um, p.m., uh, this is where I tried to identify in the previous slide that there's, there are no parking spaces currently that someone from the public could come and park all day. And so in talking with the applicant, um, if the council is interested, we've identified that we would create a new daily parking pass for banquet facilities. We currently have parking passes, daily passes for commuters and employees. So. Um, in this situation, the applicant would need to secure passes for those events and would need to distribute those before the event. Um, in terms of the evening, um, talking about weddings, birthday parties, other events, um, um, applicant has indicated that, you know, that uh, valet parking <clears throat> would uh, be available. In fact, um, on the weekend, she had indicated that more than 75 guest events would be required to have valet parking. Um, staff has suggested that any evening event that has 75 guests or more be required to provide valet parking with the idea of trying to get people into the garage versus parking on the street. And then on the weekend during the day, um, 
there would be on street and off street parking and if if the events were large enough um, the possibility of valet parking in terms of uh, the zoning relief as I said previously um, bank the the two districts don't anticipate um, or specifically call out banquet facilities as allowed use um, this table lists the current food related businesses that are allowed in the district um, during the previous reviews of the applicants request the council discussed options for how to allow the proposed banquet um, and reception hall um, a majority of the council favored one of two approaches. One approach would be to amend the zoning ordinance to allow the proposed banquet facility by right. The other approach would be the approach that we're presenting this evening, would be to further study um, whether to amend the zoning code by allowing this um, banquet and reception hall and this would be part of our study to see how it works this would be a one-time basis um, uh, the council would approve and permit the applicant to use the subject property for a banquet and reception hall pursuant to uh, specific terms and conditions which I'll, I'll talk about in the um, a little later that are addressed in the resolution so tonight we are presenting to you the second approach um, of how to allow this within the zoning district. So the, the resolution, um, we try to uh, establish some parameters in terms of uh, what, what we're allowing and what are operational requirements. So when the council last discussed this, there was some reservation by some council members about the cafe food shop not being part of it. And so what we did is now that the applicant proposes it to be part of it is how do we define what that means to be part of it. Um, so, and then we talk about the banquet facility um, and what makes it what it is, and then facility noise standards as well as parking loading and var uh, valet parking plans. So um, I'm going to try to go through this quickly. Um, so uh, one concept that the council wanted was that this restaurant needed or food shop needed to be along the street. And the applicant is showing that, so we describe that it needs to be along the street and needs to occupy a minimum amount of frontage, 75%. That it needs to maintain a transparent storefront and the customer seating, display areas need to be along the, the storefront. Uh, there would be a minimum seating um, and a minimum size. And that um, she would agree to be open a minimum number of days a week for a minimum number of hours, which are listed there. And then, of course, there are exceptions. Um, in terms of the banquet facility, um, that it could only be used for private by invitation only events. Um, that it could be uh, seating for no more than 150 and have to have at least 4,000 square feet for the, the banquet venue area. That um, a majority of the food at the event has to come from the site, be prepared on site. It's not a facility where someone can rent it and then cater the food in, um, which is her model. Uh, her model is to prepare the food on site, I should say. Um, and that seating must be available at tables at events and that it's not to be primarily used for live entertainment and and dancing that the the wedding reception with dancing and entertainment but it's not an entertainment live event venue um, all events must include a food package again this is tying her model um, in terms of when someone rents the space, they need to secure a food package as part of that, and that you can only uh, purchase a liquor package if you've also purchased a food package. Um, events in the space may be scheduled on certain days and times. So Sunday through Thursday would be 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., and then there's a list of exceptions she's requested 
in terms and these are mainly around holidays um, when uh, uh, well, Memorial Day is always on a Monday and Labor Day is too, but the Sunday before, she wants to go till midnight on those Sundays. If July 3rd is on a Sunday, she'd also like to go to midnight on July 3rd. And then December 30th, she typically has events till midnight. And then on December 31st, because of the new year, would like to be open until 1 a.m. Um, on January, into the morning of January 1st. Typically then on Friday and Saturday events could go until midnight unless there's an exception noted above. Um, in terms of noise, when we last spoke with the council, um, at that point in time the council seemed to f give direction that you were, more com you were okay with a more general approach to the noise standard. Um, if the council wishes to go in another direction, having something more specific, we can explore that option. I'd just also like to note, uh, we do have our general public nuisance standard regarding noise, um, in which um, is enforced on a complaint basis. Um, in terms of parking, um, employees, uh, the applicant would be required to get permits for each employee uh, that would be driving to the site and the employee must park in um, uh, parking areas for employees, in village lots for employees. Um, sorry, mouth getting really dry. Um, weekdays between um, <coughs> As I mentioned earlier, weekdays um, during the day when there are events, uh, the valet and the valet service is not provided. The applicant must purchase permits um, for a guest and must make all reasonable efforts to distribute those permits before the event. Um, and that any event that starts after 5 p.m. on a, any event after 5 p.m. and has more than 75 registered guests, um, valet parking services must be provided. Thank you. Um, so, so I should mention, uh, so how this is currently structured is that um, before the applicant can op open and operate, she has to have an approved plan, approved by staff, parking plan. And what we've done here is outline what would be some minimum aspects of that. Um, and so that when the applicant moves forward and she'd secure with her valet parking service, a valet parking permit, all of that would be handled administratively. That's how we have it structured right now. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. So these are to identify some things that would need to be in the parking plan. And there may be other things as we move forward. Um, if she has weekend daytime events, um, we said she will encourage applicants to park in village lots and garages um, to try to keep them off the street. Um, she's also requested that two spaces in front um, of the business be designated for loading zones. Uh, staff suggests that they be 15 minute parking spaces rather than loading zones. Uh, she anticipates anticipates customers may be parking there and running in to pick up food items or on a rare occasion or not rare but on occasion uh, vendors may stop there and quickly run things in and out and we set up a standard for that limited loading that can occur um, along the street and then uh, what she has asked is her events um, stop at 10 p.m. or at midnight and that she'd like an hour after the event ends, so if it ends at midnight until 1, um, to have vendors remove items from the venue. And so this is just establishing that aspect of allowing her, the event must, must end at 10 or midnight or 1 a.m. on New Year's Eve, but then um, her vendors have an hour after that to uh, remove items um, from the venue. Um, 
So also on the agenda is to create a new liquor classification as well as consider approving a liquor license and, and Chief Hornstein is here um, to address those issues. And then we have worked with um, the village attorney, public works director, the police chief, uh, the economic development coordinator on valet uh, parking regulations. Um, a valet parking permit would re be required if you're having a valet service related to a business in a commercial district. Uh, the ordinance goes into details in terms of what, may, what would need to be submitted as part of a plan for uh, securing that uh, parking uh, valet permit and um, other requirements such as insurance and indemnification. Again, the approval of that valet parking permit would be handled administratively by staff and there would be an application fee to cover the cost of processing that application. Um, so tonight uh, we have these five items before you um, and uh, we're here uh, to hear uh, your comments and your discussion after you hear from the public. Um, the ordinances, you could, if you wish, introduce them tonight. Uh, tonight, you would take no action on the resolutions. You would wait to take action on those um, until you're ready to take action on the two ordinance at a future meeting, uh, which the soonest that would be would be May 7th. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> um, why don't we do this? Why don't we open it up um, for the public hearing? Okay. And um, I'd invite any audience, any public comments, questions, concerns, um, please step on up and then we'll come back to the council for questions and discussion. Um, if we have technical questions. Um, we'll come back to it after the, the technical questions. Yeah. It, okay. So if we'll, just for clarification, I don't know if that would help the public or not. We can do it as part of the public comment. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, it's straight start, please. Yeah. Sure, would the applicant like to step up? Yeah. Okay, please do. Okay, thank you. Um, I've been in contact with David and the village quite a bit over the last couple of months. So this in no way has been just like this really quick process. Um, and I do know that there are concerns um, and I'm happy to address them. I know the biggest one seems to be around noise. Um, and we are working with, you know, we'll be working with an architect who that is their main concern right now. We met with them yesterday, then they went and met with um, the village as well. Um, I just want to point out that I think we're going to be a really good addition to the community, that's really what I'm looking for. I think especially the cafe, it's gonna be a, a great place for people to come in, get the food that we're known for. I've been in business for 11 years. Um, we service a very, very high-end clientele in the city and the suburbs. I have a large North Shore clientele already. So the reason I'm wanting to move my business to Winnetka is because I saw a potential gap in the market, truthfully, for the North Shore. And I thought that we would be the right company to fill it. Um, with the venue, um, it's just another option, you know? It's like, I know we have, you guys have the community house, which is great. I know that there's restaurants here, which are great, but it's just another option. It's aesthetically different. Um, it's going to be very similar to my venue in the West Loop. Um, so it's, it's just another option for bridal showers, baby showers, you know, anniversary parties, birthday parties. And yes, we are going to have weddings there, but... I do need to point out, you know, we're talking about, you know, loading out till 1 a.m. and all of that kind of stuff, which sounds like, oh, my God, you know. Um, but truthfully, we own the tables and we own the chairs. We, can, we have the plate, silverware, the flatware. So the only vendors who are going to be loading out at the end of the night. So, you know, a wedding happens, 11.45 is last call. By midnight, we're, you know, every, the music's shut down, the lights are going on. This is how it currently is at our, at our space. Um, Really, it's two vendors right now that are loading out. It's whichever, the band or the DJ that's playing in the space, and then the florist comes back. So what we do is the doors are closed, the lights are on, the music is off. Those vendors are inside our space, you know, 
wrapping up all of their stuff, getting all of their stuff, and then when, it's, when they're completely ready to go, they go, they get their vehicle, they come around through the back, we open the door, and they load out. I mean, it's after midnight, everybody wants to get out of there. You know, we also, I own a catering company, so a good majority of my business is at off-site catered events. I'm in people's homes, I'm in other venues in the city, so we're usually one of the last vendors to load out from an event, especially a wedding. Um, and so it's like, I, I do this every weekend. It's, it's, I mean, you can't be at Chicago Cultural Center like being loud in the alley and you know, making a big noise and staying till 1.30 in the morning. It happens very efficiently. It's very quiet. Like it's, we work with like really professional vendors. Because I've been in business for 11 years and because I've been running a venue already for five years, I feel very comfortable and confident saying this to you guys. So, you know, we are going to have the cafe. I think the venue is really going to be a good addition. Um, and then my, my catering company as well will, will be on site. It'll just all be on site. Do you guys have any questions? Well, uh, we want to start with the public. Okay. Um, but thank you. You can take a seat. Maybe okay. if anyone from the, else from the public would like to come on up and speak, please do so. This is your, your opportunity. Uh, well, you know what, we'll start, <laughs> so it's not, uh, we'll start with you, yes, front row, Hi. yes, come on up. We'll, Hi. we'll start and we'll go back that way and then we'll come back to the front. Okay. I'm Julie Erst. I'm at 983 Vine Street. I did not intend to come talk this evening. Um, I'm here hosting Boy Scouts <laughs> for a merit badge. But this venue is in my community. I'm two blocks south of the McDonald's at Tower and Green Bay. Um, and in hearing the presentation, I have concerns. Um, one about the valet parking, especially for the larger events. Um, valet parkers just kind of park wherever they want. And I am afraid that they're going to be doing surface street parking. My street is well within walking distance of this venue, um, which I think is a great addition to Hubbard Woods. We need to diversify Hubbard Woods. And I think, especially with the little cafe, will be a wonderful addition to Hubbard Woods. I'm not saying I'm not in favor of this from what I, the little bit that I've heard tonight. Um, as I said, I know nothing other than what I've heard tonight. Um, and my other concern, two concerns, and they kind of go together, is the late nights that is, are being requested by the vendor or by the, by the uh, person who, who wants to do the cafe. Um, you know, midnight is, is, is late, late to be letting out. Loading in, loading out at 1 o'clock is late. This isn't, with respect, this isn't the city. We're not used to having these, this extra noise of the brakes of the trucks and the people talking. You can't control the vendors and how, what they do when they load in and out. Um, there is noise ordinance, yes, but it's, we're a quiet community. Um, so that's one, one concern I have. Another concern I have, again, goes, goes by um, the, the parking. You can't control the people when they leave your venue. If they're going to be out on the street making noise, that's a concern because Hubbard Woods is very family-oriented. It's got, you know, the school right there. There are lots of families with young children. And if there are people out on the street making noise because they get out late from a venue, it's, it's going to be a concern, and it's going to be a problem. I guess Thank you. that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move one row back. And uh, when you step up, please state your name and address, if you would. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for letting me present. My name is Ed Jertson, and my wife, Alexandra, and I live at 900 Old Green Bay Road. And so um, we've been in the village for about 22 years. And when I first came to the village, uh, I had the pleasure of serving on the Winneka Caucus. And one of the things that taught me was that if something is not happening in your own backyard, it was tough to get any kind of input at all from the communities I'm sure you're all well aware of. So on Sunday, uh, Jesse Butler happened to come by her house and knock on the door and said, hey, oh, well, by the way, there's a meeting on Tuesday. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we got the notice. And she sent me, a, she gave us a packet of what was entailed in tonight's discussion. Um, it's impressive. And I applaud the board and I applaud Mrs. Vasquez for the efforts to put this forth. Um, three resolutions and two ordinance changes. I mean, this is, this is Winneka in motion, which is great. But I have a challenge with the process, as the previous speaker just mentioned. 
Um, one of the things that, when reading through the notes, was the courtesy notification of 250 feet around the venue. And what I'd like to do is, you know, just pass this down. Um, I'm not sure how many single-family households may have been notified in this process, but a 250-foot radius uh, doesn't really do much in regards to that notification. Um, this is going to impact us directly. So this is in my backyard. So a stone's throw, and when I mean a stone's throw, a literal stone's throw. Like I picked up a rock in my backyard and see how far I can throw it, and I hit the bank on the other side without a problem. So of all the people who are going to be affected, the ones most affected are going to be myself and my wife and my family. So one of the things that I know we potentially have this going out into May, is to increase the notification. But not only just a generic notification, but what you're trying to accomplish here. Because this is, knowing the village, being here as long as I am, this has been a Herculean effort to get to this, to get to this spot. And again, I applaud all involved in terms of getting us here. So parking is an issue. Parking has always been an issue in Hubbard Woods. And so the parking analysis, again, we had a road analysis done on our street years ago, and it's a great analysis that kind of shows things, but it doesn't quite give us exactly some of the concerns or help with the concerns that might be handling around parking. Having 150 people leave a venue and parking in the parking garage, my guess is the neighbors on Scott, both east and west of um, uh, Green Bay have no idea of what might come their way about 1 o'clock on Saturday morning in terms of people leaving those parking spaces. Secondly, uh, I live on Hibbard Street. Hibbard Street? Is that where we live on? Hibbard Street? Green Bay, but it's Hibbard Street. It's like Hibbard Street, Hibbard Court. I always get them confused. So 22 years later. So people always end up, if there's an event over at Hubbard Woods Park, people always end up parking on our street, which it in turn gets to be quite a nightmare of people coming in and out of that venue. My guess is that you're going to have a couple of savvy people who are attending an event who are going to figure out that they can park for free and get quicker access to their car by parking just east of where the venue is. And so I don't believe the village has the time nor the inclination to do something like they do at Ravinia, which is keep people from parking on the side streets. But I can tell you that's what's going to happen because it's happened before with different village events over the years. So. Public nuisances, this is great. So I'm not gonna extroll too much about the noise nuisance because our neighbor, um, uh, uh, Robert Chris, sent you guys a very nice note in a very legalese way about the noise ordinances. So that was just absolutely great. But the great thing about the public nuisances is Winneka has done a really good job with them because there's no barns for keeping animals and there's no gambling houses, so great job, right? So, but when you get down to the noise ordinances, that is an important point. And I appreciate the fact that, um, you know, noise could be in control. But again, this is completely self-centered and all on me, is that's literally outside our bedroom window. So when we're not supposed to have leaf blowers, which no one ever pays attention to in terms of those re rolls, or when garbage trucks can, could or should in the village come up and down the alleyway, we're not the ones calling the village manager and complaining every five minutes. That's just the way it is. So that is an important element to all of this. So a couple parts. The process is really important. So again, it's been a great due diligence process, but I can tell you that again, if we didn't get a knock on our door on Sunday afternoon, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have gone through all the notes and all the meetings and gone through that because again, we got a notice about some event is gonna be, there's a new venue in, in the village of Winneka. And I'm like, great, that's terrific. But again, diving down to this, my guess is there's not a lot of people who know the depth and the detail of what's uh, potentially ahead of them. The village of Winneka should welcome Mrs. Vasquez. We should welcome her because this is a great addition to Hubbard Woods. Hubbard Woods is in desperate need of business um, and the business district. Yet I find the process could be expanded more. There should be more voices here besides just me and a couple of our neighbors who happen to have their door knocked on in terms of what's going on here. Again, it wasn't in our backyard until all of a sudden we discovered it's in our backyard. And I think as more and more of our neighbors discover that this could affect them, I would like to hear their voices and welcome them to the process. So the one other thing that I'll add is again, looking at all the work that's been done in terms of the regulation of the audiences, this should be a special use process. This should be a special use process, not to slow it down. I understand the speed and way things are going and all that other good stuff, but we need to take a more in-depth process with more voices uh, to come to the podium. So thank you for your time 
And Ms. Vasquez, thank you very much for your interest in Winnetka. Thank you. Okay, we'll keep moving back. Same row. No, nope. next row. Step on up, thank you. So I'm uh, Peter Butler, uh, husband of the famous Jesse Butler, who's been uh, referenced, and she picked on me last time uh, saying I uh, stole candy from Mage's drugstore when I was in second grade in Hubbard Woods. So, but th thank, as, I'd like to thank you too for uh, David, you know, not everybody probably comes in the morning and say, you're just doing a great job, thanks a lot, but you've really done a good job staffing this and it makes it all really easy to understand even though a lot of people don't know about the project. And you've done a great job of doing everything you can to kind of accommodate your business to um, what's required by the village and, the, and you as, a, as trustees have done a, a great job of discussing this. However, uh, I do um, um, oppose this, but uh, in part is the process. Um, but I, I, I have comments on three levels. One is the noise um, issue, and I think you're going to hear some more about that. So that's one level. The second level is that I feel that you know this is prime commercial space for a banquet hall, and it, and it is a use not permitted by the current zoning code. And the heart of the business, really, I think, you would say and admit is the two weekend nights from 6 p.m. to 12 when you do have the weddings. That's the, the heart of the business. You do have other activities during the day sometimes and so forth. And while we want a vibrant commercial district, um, virtually all the vibrancy will occur at a time <laughs> that is not wanted or needed. <laughs> this is kind of ironic. Uh, the willingness to include retail for eight hours a day, five days a week at a minimum is appreciated. But my gut business sense is that the 912 feet you have uh, penciled in for that is really pretty small to succeed. Um, and yet you really can't grow it uh, to larger than that because the banquet space also needs to be of a certain space. And I think this was pointed out at, the, at your last meeting um, or one of the meetings where, you know, it, we would love to have the retail, we would love to have it, but it's not the heart of your business model. And it, it feels like you're doing it in order to gain the approval of, of the board here, um, because you pulled it um, and now have put it back in. And so it, it's something that you've, you've put in to get approval, not at the heart of really what you want to do. So my fear is um, you'll do your best at it. it, it might very likely fail, and when it fails, um, you are going to want to cut back on it, and then you'll be out of compliance with what the terms of the agreement, the resolution is that you have in place. And the way I read that resolution, it says if you're not in compliance, then you're out of luck on the whole business if you follow through with the agreement itself. So that's a pretty tough constraint to put on, I, th I think, the business. but. I'm not sure that that part of the business is going to be successful. Um, so um, uh, the last thing I would say on the third level that relates to the one-off process, um, and I think it's just putting the cart before the horse. I do not understand it really. What good is it to study the issues after the approval has already been given? I think that's what you do. You're giving a one-off approval and then you're going to study a wide range of issues which can ultimately re result in changing zoning and parking and things like that. But in the meantime, they're often running in this business. And I don't know whether they get then grandfathered in to what ultimately gets resolved. I don't understand uh, why you would do um, um, all of this study when, in fact, they've already got approval. Um, so and my concern is that the things that you are studying like valet parking and its fees, like special uh, regular parking for the event and its fees, like liquor license, all have precedent-setting poss possibilities that go beyond this particular uh, proposal. So as you put in motion suddenly, here's how we're going to do valet parking, that how they can do it, what does that imply for the rest of the businesses in Winnetka? Because this is a big step, and it seems like you're already tipping your 
toe into something that you're going to, you know, the, the spirit elephant's going to open up across the street as a restaurant. They're going to say, well, we want ballet parking too. What do you say to them when it's still under study? It, the, the whole point in the end is it seems to me, um, you know, I've sat on several boards such as these myself, and you need to get input, consider the options, make tough decisions, and you're not going to please everyone. But it, it just seems that this needs to be more broadly understood by the community, and I would agree 100% that it should be subjected to the special use permitting so that we really have the appropriate dialogue, because I think we're racing to resolution of some issues that go beyond the banquet facility that set precedent for the for the for the village uh, that belong in a process that is is different from the one-off that's being presented as part of these resolutions tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, please step on up. I'm back again. I'm Jesse Butler. I spoke to you at the last meeting. Um, I just wanted to. I know you have some. Have heard some of my concerns about. Uh, the venue. Um, I think this is a one, I looked at your website, it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, I know the idea of a ca cafe with takeout food. I would live at your place. You know, we live right next to the tracks. I would be there all the time. The only thing is I have a problem with is this venue. And um, I've been talking to neighbors and business owners in Hubbard Woods, some of them who received this notice, oops, excuse me, notice which says it talks about a banquet and reception facility. No one I've spoken with to a person thought that it, it involved wedding venues or special event venues that went to midnight. They thought banquets, they thought it was kind of like a special meal, uh, you know, a get-together kind of a thing. Nobody thought it involved a band or anything like that. So um, I, as I look at the agenda for tonight, um, and you've done all these kinds of things, it seems like the council has bent over backwards to accommodate the proposed business plan. Um, with the text amendment that you might do and all the resolutions. But I wonder why the council has not considered the neighbors and the community in general as much as they have the proposed business. Why, when it came up before and someone said, is there any, are there any, isn't there an apartment there above Walgreens? Well, there are, there are seven apartments. There are also apartments on the other wall south where there is someone living there. There are 24 apartments right across the street in that little enclave. Half a block down, there's another 20 or so. Then across the tracks are ours, Ed and my. There are about, what, eight, ten houses in there that are going to definitely be affected. No one said, which houses are, is this going to possibly, we have to stand up and say, we're here, we're whatever. All these things are done. Nobody said, what's, who's there, who is it going to affect? You know, we've talked about the noise. I think I may have told you that um, I went over to the community house to find out how they handled the noise. She said, when it's outside, sometimes we get a call. We're not dealing with that here. When it's inside, we occasionally get a call. But she says, we're kind of buffered around that area. But as I said before, the complaints we get are when people come out of the venue. So you're going to have 150 people coming out onto Green Bay, perhaps coming out the back after having a great time, whether you have valet or a party bus or they're walking to get their car. It's going to be a mess. We hear kids during the day in Hubbard Woods Park screaming and carrying on. Great. We move next to the park. We move next to the train. We knew what we were getting. We do not want to hear a, a bunch of party goers coming out into Hubbard Woods Park, walking there, coming out in front. The apartments right across the street will have them right under their windows. It just it doesn't make sense. I think it's, you have a wonderful product here. It's just not right for this, this area. Um, Let's see. Uh, valet parking, I have some question about if this should go through. You're, someone on your, um, of the trustees said it's a ghost town in Winnetka. In the middle of the summer, it's far from a ghost town in Hubbard Woods. Cars, I could see, for, see backing up on Green Bay, valet parkers running across the park, kids on their bikes, could be an incredible mess. I don't think you've come up with these regulations of valet parking, but you haven't really talked to the people in the area how it would affect. Um, let's see, uh, the one I noticed walking in, in Hubbard Woods, there was a special use, a huge sign for, I guess, an architect right across from Minos. There's something to do with special use. He might lose his special use, whatever. Huge sign, special use coming up. What? No one up and down Hubbard Woods, the vendors, what, I mean, the, 
the businesses, whatever, knew anything about this other than this kind of innocuous thing about there's going to be a banquet facility. You need special use. You need a big sign. We can all go and hash it out. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe, maybe this would be great, but I think you need to, uh, to think through a little bit more. I also urge each of you to go over and look at the space. I don't know any, if, if any of you have. Uh, exactly how close it is to all these apartments and homes. And lastly, I ask you, and this is a little bit tongue in cheek, but it's true. If this is such a great idea, would you consider approving this business as a banquet facility, which really is a party venue, if, you, if it were moving in 100 feet or less next to your house? Okay, thank you for your Thank time. you. Okay, um, we'll keep moving back. And in the interest of time, we do ask People, we're trying to keep it under three minutes. We know there's a lot to say, uh, but just as a courtesy to everybody, so get a chance to speak before it's too late. Hi, Maureen Block, um, 814 Prospect, so I'm not a neighbor um, at the facility. And I really appreciate that it's hard to use that space. It's a beautiful space. The building is really neat in that giant space. I can see where it would seem like a good place for a banquet hall. My main concern is I'm out uh, late at night a lot, and Coming home, I'm concerned about drunk drivers. You're talking about liquor until 15 minutes before they tell them to leave. You're there all night eating and drinking. Sure, then you're going to have a valet pick up their car so they can drive home after drinking. <laughs> um, and don't forget, you've got to consider Uber and party buses. I think that's another great point. Uh, but where are the Ubers going to go? Assuming people drink and they don't want to drive. That's 100 cars, probably, 100 drivers. And if we're going to get 50 Ubers, suddenly it does look like the west side. But it's Winnetka. It's not the west side of Chicago. Those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next. You know, I, I was planning on commenting on this, but I don't think I'll be here when what I came here for gets around. Um, Ted Winnichenko, um, just quickly, 30 seconds. I think it's a good idea. Um, you know, this is the same thing that goes on, it's been going on, I've been here for, what, what, 15 years, 10 years, whatever, and every time someone proposes something, we want a vibrant community, look at Highland Park, look at Wilmette, blah, 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 then every time something's proposed, oh my God, what if this, what if this, what if this. So I, I feel for the people that live near it, but I think for the community, it's probably a good idea. Thanks, sir. Uh, next. <clears throat> My name is Joni Weitzel. Um, I'll try to make it really brief, but I think that I'm affected the most by, by this proposal. I own and manage the building next door, 925 Green Bay Road. It's an apartment building. We also have uh, one of our tenants is Walgreens. The representative could not be here today, but they're also completely opposed to this. We also only received notification for this particular meeting. So we didn't get the first notice, even though we're registered to receive it. Um, my biggest concern is parking and the noise. So some of the apartment buildings are adjacent to this, this facility and the venue that will go on it late at nights will affect the tenants. Their bedroom windows go out to that side, um, balcony doors. So, so it, it definitely will be an issue. We also have an issue with parking at that building. Um, we have a garage. We provide all of our tenants with a garage space, but people that have more than uh, two vehicles and need to park behind the building have had issues finding parking. So I know that there will be issues with maybe valet or, or some of the people attending the venues that will park in some of the designated spots that are allocated for our tenants and Walgreens parking lot, which is our property. So that's going to be a huge concern. I know at the next meeting, um, Walgreens representative will probably join me, but we're definitely opposed to this. Can I ask Thank you one quick time. question? Yes. Um, so your tenants, do they have, do they have, are, are there spots that are designated um, for the tenants outside the building? Correct. So what, are, what kind of a permit do they have? Do they have a, a permit? It's on our lot. It's, so it's on, our, on our land. And so it's on the, the building. The wall, but it's Walgreens open. Line? Correct. It's, the Walgreens it's behind the Walgreens parking. 
Oh, so it's at the very rear of the lot? Yeah. Got it. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll keep moving back. Yes, please, come on up. Uh, Mead Montgomery, 945 Old Green Bay Road. Another of the neighbors who were unnotified and unaware of this until Jesse started beating on doors. So I think that's very helpful. I think there is a process issue here of scope of notification of people who are directly impacted by this. Um, so first blushes tonight. The first thing that strikes you is the number of exceptions or ordinances that are being requested to be changed or modified or written for this. That ought to be a huge red flag. It's one thing to have, okay, we're gonna move something a couple of feet, but you have a list of five and each of those has probably a lot of sub points to it. So I think that's just a huge red flag. And you wonder, doesn't that put it, if it's that broad, into the special use category. Repeating some of the things, we're more or less directly across it on Old Green Bay Road. Obvious noise, concerns of people coming and going. Uh, Old Green Bay Road in Hubbard Woods can back up very easily. Uh, cars turning left into Walgreens can back traffic up through the traffic light. If you have valet parking going on, it's inevitable that the third or fourth car is gonna be out into the street and will block Green Bay Road. So I think valet parking has another issue with it right there. Um, we're concerned that street parking will also be a conflict with the retail establishments that are there. If you do try and have 30 or 40 people parking in that area, it's crowded. I stop by and I drive up and down that road a lot between home, office, and Winnetka. Uh, I think that can be a problem. And I think if we end up, and it does turn out to be a problem, it will have a negative impact on uh, residential real estate values um, if it proves to be a problem. So some of that's repetitious. I appreciate that. but. Uh, I think you want to hear the fact that a lot of us feel pretty seriously about it. And we, Thank you. We appreciate your comments. Uh, and anyone else moving back? Uh, Jack, come on up. Uh, Jack Cole at Archie 568 Cherry. I was, in terms of the plan, one of the things I was thinking about is that, is it possible that there are too many businesses making claims on the parking that is available in the parking structure on the streets. Um, I'm not sure if there were 150 people at the venue, and let's say that it was two people per car, that's 75 cars. Uh, Minos and the other places in the areas might have, I'm just worried that there might be too many spots being promised and that we're not keeping track of how many possible spots we have. The reason that that would become a problem is it might start pushing out into the streets, and then the neighbors, as they're raising the issue, would find uh, people tromping across their yards and all kinds of things that would create irritation and conflict. So that was just something I was thinking of. Um, the other thing is, is that is there, and I don't know if it's possible to economically do this, but is there a way to soundproof the space to cut down on the noise? Because I, I, I guess as the speaker pointed out, that's a lot of people very close to um, to a venue that might create a lot of noise and create a lot of people very irritated up until midnight. And they might be getting something that they would say, I didn't bargain for that. I mean, if you move over Walgreens, you know what you're getting. But if somebody moves in, so I don't know. There might not be an economic solution to the sound problem, but I think that that has the potential for creating a lot of uh, potentially irritated residents. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Jack. Uh, we'll Move to the back. Are we done on this side? Anybody else? Okay. Please come on up. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Uh, my name is Dave Schwartz. My wife, Susan, and uh, 
My wife and her father, uh, Ray Chappie, are the owners of the building uh, directly south of 915. So uh, uh, the gentleman said that he was a stone's throw away. We're actually, the building that uh, we own is actually enjoined with the 915 building. So uh, we have many of the same con concerns that uh, have already been voiced, so I'll be kind of brief. Uh, I do have something in writing here that I thought maybe we could hand. Are, is your building the one with Scandal in it? W with, uh, it's Marigold's is on the bottom. It used to be Adam's Act uh, Fine uh, yeah. Homes yeah. Was, on, was there also. There um, so, yeah, uh, with the Green Bay Corridor, I know, I know it's uh, zoned for commercial and retail, but uh, I think we got to keep in mind, too, that there's probably just as much square footage for resident residences in in the apartments on the corridor there as there is um, for the retail space. So uh, I think these people, including the two apartments that we have above our building, are going to be impacted, you know, greatly by this. I have some pictures. I don't have them here with me, but the building in question, the 915 building, actually has a skylight that runs the entire length of the the building that it would, I think, would be impossible probably to soundproof or, or buffer the sound coming through that. So the apartments that were discussed on either side of this building are, I would imagine the sound is just going to be intense through there with with live music. And, uh, you know, our main concern is with these weddings, because basically what a wedding is is a party, and there's going to be alcohol, there's going to be unlimited alcohol at most of these weddings, uh, free alcohol, people are going to take advantage of that. And then come midnight, you're going to have uh, this venue closed down 15 minutes you know, after they uh, quit their drinking, and they're all going to expel onto the sidewalk, I would imagine, waiting for these porters who then have to travel over 100 yards to the parking deck to get cars and bring them back. And you're going to have all these people on the sidewalk with nowhere to go. They're going to be, some of them, to be honest, are going to be intoxicated, and they're going to be making noise. They're going to be yelling. They're going to be uh, doing all that, and it's going to be, uh, you know, quite a detriment to the to the people at that time that that want to, frankly, get to sleep. Especially in the summer when people, our building doesn't have central air, so a lot of times people want to open the window and, and that's going to impact them with that. The, another thing that wasn't brought up was uh, the smoking issue. Uh, I would imagine when people are drinking or when they're at a party, uh, uh, people are going to want to come out and have a cigarette. I don't know where that's going to be done, but again, our windows are going to be open and uh, these people are going to, I would imagine, be out on the sidewalk somewhere and, I, and, and have to move away from the uh, entrance of the building and and smoking and that's going to also impact us um, so these are just some of the things uh, you know that were brought up uh, that we also bring up and are very concerned with um, so I appreciate your time thank you thank you uh, moving forward Terry come on up Good evening. I am Terry Dace, and I'm the Executive Director of the Winneka Northfield Chamber of Commerce, and I'll be speaking on that, their behalf, uh, as well as on my personal behalf um, from living in the village for over 30 years now. Um, I want, would like to address a few things. We are so very fortunate to have a business like this who is very interested in moving into Winneka. We need businesses like this with a reputation as stellar as hers. We would be very fortunate to have them. The North Shore is deficit in the venue of businesses like this. And selfishly, I am hosting four showers this year, and I do not have a venue in or around Winneka that I can host any showers because there's no place to do it. I am taking all of my business to the city of Chicago, and that breaks my heart. Um, Minos. Let's talk about Minos. Minos is one of the busiest restaurants in this North Shore community, all up and down. There are a lot of people that go there starting at 5 o'clock p.m. They start filling up. People just line up at that door and just fill it up until the, through the evening. 
and they have um, an outdoor space, and there has never been any complaints of noise or any issues with parking or any other um, complications that have gone on with Minos being in uh, Hubbard Woods with any of the residents that I have ever heard of. I think that they are a good citizen. I think that this new venue would be a good citizen for our village. Um, most businesses close in Hubbard Woods at 5 p.m. I don't think that there would be any parking issues. I live in Hubbard Woods and have, have done so for 30 years. Um, I recently attended a Hubbard Woods Design District meeting, and all of the businesses that were attending at, at the meeting were in support of having this venue. And hopefully most of them have written you a, um, an email as they said that they were going to do because of not being able to be here this evening. Um, food venues add vibrancy and bring new businesses to communities. We need food venues. That makes business want to be in our village. Um, sound has been addressed with her architect. I don't think there will be any issues. I think that um, she is very interested in providing a venue that will be befitting of our community. And she has a high-end establishment already in the uh, proven business in the city of Chicago, and I believe that she would be an asset to our community. Um, we have learned a lot from the Winnetka Music Festival. We have 15,000 people in our village for two days, and we do not have any issues with drunk people walking around. We might have one or two people that are you know, over, overly served, but then their friends get them home and they're not being obnoxious and running through the neighborhoods or the streets. I think that we are a village that can handle this kind of a venue and we would do a really good job with it. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Uh, anybody else moving forward? Same side? Uh, yeah, please step up. I also came just to see what was going on. I, I was prepared for this. Um, I'd, um, I think uh, Jack had a point that on soundproofing that there are probably enough technical requirements and ordinances that you can craft something that would solve the problem of sound within the venue. Um, and I realize parking is an interesting question. Um, two things. Uh, I've been here 35 years, and I have a vague recollection of the big fight over McDonald's. All the neighbors thought it would be terribly disruptive. And it turns out to have been a big asset to the community. And whether that's a precedent or not, it just it came to mind. Uh, the other thing is uh, I'm thinking a lot of one Winnetka. Actually, it's probably second Winnetka. And before this through, we might have third Winnetka and fourth Winnetka. Um, these people have done a lot of work for here. They're investing a lot of money in trying to do this. Uh, whatever decision you come to, I hope you won't string it out at all like um, one Winnetka has been strung out. They deserve an answer, and the community deserves an answer. Uh, pretty quickly. Thank you. Would anybody else like to comment on this item? Okay. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll move it to the council for discussion. Now, keep in mind, we still have the uh, liquor ordinances that are um, up for introduction to talk about as well. Um, but so let's, we'll focus on what's been presented so far. And uh, I just open it up. I'll go first because I'm on this side. Okay by myself. Uh, so I just, uh, I appreciate that everybody came out and, and we always want village residents to come to these meetings. We'd like to have you here every week and it has a meaningful impact on our process and, and the, the process for the village. So we're really, really grateful that you guys came out. It's hard to get it so that everybody knows exactly when everything is happening and I think we all have to feel the responsibility and onus on ourselves to stay up and pay attention to what happens in the village life, you know, we in every dimension. So I would just, I would just say that, and I'm grateful that you guys are here. You know, I think when we look at at our jobs as trustees, you know, it is about creating a vibrant community and about maintaining the level of quality that we all believe is Winnetka. And so balancing that is sometimes a, a little bit of a job. But you know, when I look at the issues that face Winnetka. You know, the biggest issue is new revenues. 
and supporting the infrastructure that we need to support as a village and the, the debasement and the devastation of our retail net, yeah, offerings in this village and the tax receipts that go with that is just stunning. And the empty storefronts, it's, it's a horrible burden for us to carry as a, as a community and it's affecting communities everywhere. And when I look at a business like Gourmet Bites, I think, wow, this is amazing. And with some proper care, I think that the issues of sound and parking can be carefully resolved and hopefully working in partnership with residents to be sure that the soundproofing is adequate and that the parking is adequate. But you know, I think that uh, we can all get a little bit too worried. I also live in Hubbard Woods. I also drive on Green Bay Road. You know, I, that's my area too. And I think that you know, looking at having some vibrancy and options for people. Now, it, it falls a little bit in a funny space because many people are members of private clubs in Winneka. And so the idea that there's a venue space for residents falls on deaf ears sometimes. But not everybody's a member of a private club. There are a lot of people that aren't. And so they have similar needs that they'd like to have events in their communities. And as Terry pointed out, she's forced to go down to the city. Others of us would like to have events in our community because we're not members of private clubs. So I, I have to say, after listening and, and working on this process, and I think we've been very open about it, uh, nobody's hiding anything. And, and we're going to continue this to the next time for you guys to talk about it some more. But I, I, you know, I'm not really sure what there is to talk about. There's a lot of fear about what this will engender. But you know, in terms of the upside for the community, it's a tremendous business whose main focus, I think, you know, we shouldn't be too quick to judge. I'm not sure it's events. I think it's catering. And that is a permitted use in the overlay. And I will point out that we have a business district where this is going into. And you know, that's what happens in business districts. They get filled with businesses that are OK. So anyway, I don't mean to sound harsh. And I do appreciate that you're here. And I hope that you all come back and bring other people and continue to discuss it, because it's important. But I think we have to balance the needs of the, co the community and understand where we have opportunity to improve our community. And when we get something as great as Gourmet Bites that's interested in coming here, I think we should be really thrilled. Moving down the row, we can just go in order. Well, like. Can we ask questions first? You can ask questions, make comments, whatever. Um, I guess I need to be refreshed on it was mentioned about the architecture, the architect work for noise. And if someone could refresh us exactly what you're doing to handle the noise. Yes, please. And also, Ms. Pasco, it's kind of to what standard are you, as you talk about it, what standard are you working toward? So the LOI process with the landlord took quite a while. So we have really recently engaged our architect. Um, and so this has been a process that has just started recently. But that was the main thing that they brought up when they came to the space. They see the neighborhood. Um, so we are going to meet again, and they are going to present their ideas for noise minimization. That's basically where we're at in the process with them right now. Um, I also do want to say something else. Um, a lot of people discussed or you know had concerns about 100 to 150 guests leaving the venue at midnight, which is completely valid, except that that's really not what happens at a wedding. I don't know the last wedding you went to that you stayed till the very end of the night. So dinner service is usually done by 9 p.m. And then that's when you know kind of the dancing fun portion of it starts. By 10, 10.30, we've lost a good portion. By 11, we've lost a really good portion. And by the very end of the night, we have about 25% of the guest count left. So our average weddings, our current space is 150 guests seated with a dance floor. Our average wedding is 120 guests. By midnight, there's no more than 30 guests ever left at a wedding. I just think it's important to point that out because it's not 100 to 150 guests coming out at that time. We also always have two doormen for every single wedding whose job it is to kind of control um, you know, guests, especially at the end of the night. Um, and I can honestly say, even being in the city, in the West Loop, we have never had a problem with anything at the end of the night. Um, back on the noise, when do you expect this review, this plan to be presented? I would say within, I mean, they, they know the time frame. So I think with by next week, we'll hear something from them. For right. sure, within two weeks, I think we'll have a really solid plan. OK, and to Trustee Meyer's point, do you have any 
standards that you're working toward? Do you have a, you know, a vision of where you want to be when all is said and done? What do you mean? On noise? You know, what, what you plan on doing in your yeah, mind? Well, the building is fully, there's no windows in the building. It's all brick. Um, and in the back, it's just the loading dock. There's no windows in the back either. Um, it's just, you know, the front kind of glass portion, which will fully replace so that it's more insulated, especially with noise. That is something that they brought up as well. Um, so again, I'm, all I can go off is my current venue, which is very similar. It's also completely brick. When I leave there at the end of the night and the door closes, because I usually leave during a wedding whenever I leave my venue. I never say so. I, anymore. I don't have to stay until the very, very end. Um, but when I leave and I'm, you know, walking to the parking lot to my car, it's not like I'm hearing, you know, booming music. And again, and then, you know, so it, I think there are, because it's a brick building, there already is probably going to be some good noise considerations within it. But again, the architects are working with the rest. Is, of it. is there a decibel standard that you have downtown right now? We, not that, not one that I'm aware of. I mean, DJs aren't, it's not like you're getting deaf at my venue. It's a wedding. They know people have to talk. It's not a nightclub. So I would imagine that, yeah, DJs are kind of usually working within a certain decibel for weddings specifically. Okay. And John, John Swerk, unfortunately, who knows about these things because he's an architect, isn't here tonight. But um, just following up and uh, just to be sure when you have the conversations with your architect to talk about the, um, um, about the skylight. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. Right, 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 right. Exactly. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, and um, we did we yeah. did touch on that yesterday yeah. too. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. That that would be um, really helpful. And I think that's something that we also need to talk through in terms of just in terms of what standards um, are reasonable because I, I I do think it's important that we have specificity so that everybody knows what we're talking about. Um, yeah. Um, because I think the general nuisance ordinance is too vague to be helpful to anybody. You know, it's not helpful to you. It's not helpful to staff in terms of trying to enforce it and not helpful for neighbors. So um, I think that would be useful for all of us. Um, I have a quick question while you're here. Sorry if I'm jumping. Is that, um, relative to, um, it talks about seating. Um, seating would be available at all private events. Um, I guess this is a question for staff and for you. Does that... I wasn't clear whether that meant there had to be seating for every single person or whether there would be just some seating. I, that well, seating was is available because we, we own the tables and the chairs. So we have seating for 150 guests. Um, some cocktail parties, they just require the use of our high boys. But pretty much every party we do, we, always, we have like a couple of tables out too. But some parties are just cocktail start, style parties during the week 6 to 9 or 6 to 8. And it's not really necessary to have like full seating. So I just wanted to make sure that whatever we have would be reflective again, because it's a little vague and unclear. So I want to make sure that everybody's clear on what that means. Um, I um, also um, relative to the hours of the party would be closing down at midnight, but. Um, relative to when the music closes down. I, you know, I know I've been at some events where the music stops at 11 or whatever, so um, I don't know whether that is a point of consideration that maybe we could talk about it in terms of trying to alleviate um, some, some of the questions and issues. So um, that's a point, I think, for, for consideration. Um, um, an additional point I think we need to clarify um, would be as part of the valet um, structuring uh, would be do we have sufficient space in the front um, and again I don't know how we can think about it if it's possible to be after five o'clock or something like that in terms of how many spaces would be designated because I don't I mean 15 minute parking would not suit your needs I mean, that really isn't, that's not what ballet service is. So um, I think that we need to structure the description properly and also to be sure that we do allocate enough spaces because as Mead Montgomery pointed out that traffic on Green Bay does, um, you know, can't back up quickly. So I think it would be in everybody's benefit to be sure that, um, that there's enough space allocated. Um, 
Yikes. Okay, those were um, my major issues um, at this moment, um, things that I think we need to talk about and consider. Um, While you're flipping back, can I yeah, jump please. back to me? Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is maybe more for Dave as, David as we think about the next session. So um, well, a couple of points based on the input from, from all the residents, which I, I agree with Ann, you know, this is probably the most people we've had here since one Winnetka was cruising along. So, you know, it's nice to have some company here. Um, just some a broad comment first. You know, I think for the last three years, one of the things we've been really working on here in the village is recognizing the changes that have happened in how we as consumers, as we as how we as shoppers shop, right, and the impact that that's having on our village and. And you can see it both in some of the empty storefronts, and you can see it also in some of the changes that have been going on in the village in terms of the kind of businesses that we are now allowing. More personal fitness centers. You have a, a blowout business. You have um, uh, you know, a dental office that is now in the retail overlay. Right? So we recognize that we as consumers are buying products differently but are looking for more services in a convenient location. So I think that over the last several years we have tried to figure out well what is that balance in our village of allowing services that our residents want but also recognizing we want to retain a vibrant retail district. Right? So you don't, you know, where, where is that balance line? We don't want a bunch of um, legal offices and financial planning offices. That kills off the, the, the retail district. But we have to recognize that people, as consumers, are shopping a little bit differently. Um, I think that when, when we first started looking at this, um, and there was a significant um, retail piece at the front of the store, I think we were all excited. Um, I think even with this downsized retail business, I disagree with the person who said that they didn't think it was going to make a go of it. I think that one of the challenges Ms. Vasquez is going to have in the future is saying, I'm making so much money on the retail food business. Is it worth keeping the catering business going? Um, and that's a business decision you'll have to make. Because I think that as you look at businesses up in Glencoe like Foodstuffs, um, you know, they are very, very profitable and very, you know, highly, highly trafficked. So I think that that part of the business will be vibrant and can be used. I think um, I am concerned, like, like the residents are, about parking and noise. Um, on the noise front, I do agree on the wedding side. Anybody here who's been to a North Shore wedding, you know, by 1030 at night, certainly anybody over 45 except the husband, you know, except the father of the bride and groom have probably left. Um, you know, and by 11 o'clock, it's, it's, you know, it is getting a little empty. Um, so I don't, I don't see 150 drunk people dump, being dumped on the street at midnight as really the, the, you know, what we're going to have here. Um, I think I would like to see more specific noise standards that we are working to here. Um, not, no offense to the people on Old, Old Green Bay, I think it is relatively easy to engineer a solution so that there is not a noise problem on Old Green Bay. I think that the question, which is a valid one, which is for the apartments next door. And, and that is a concern of how do we have a venue where it's a DJ or it's a band, and it's not, you know, you don't have 150, 150 screaming people in there, but, but you still have live music going on at, you know, 1130, 12 o'clock at night. How do we buffer those apartments that are 20 feet away, 25, you know, 30 feet away from, you know, from, from being annoyed? So I, I would like us as a village to have a greater standard and I think Ms. Vasquez if you and your architect can can come up with some creative ideas I think that that uh, would be helpful. Okay. Um, on the parking side uh, I think Terry's point is a valid one that um, after five o'clock at night there is not really a parking problem in Hubbardwood 
with some exceptions on some summer evenings. I, you know, clearly there are some times when it is, when it is full, but I don't think that we can, we can say we're not going to have a business because a dozen nights out of the year there's trouble parking in Hubbard Woods. I think that, that you know, we'd, be, we'd be doing ourselves a disservice. But uh, one of the things I would like to understand is how do we ensure that daily parking passes are being utilized in the parking structure or in the downtown area and we're not seeing these daily parking passes parking on Old Green Bay or in you know Hubbard Place or you know you know on, on Scott Avenue and places like that how do we how do we as a village manage those the location of those daily parking passes and where they're going to be allowed um, and then I think we need to make sure that there are rules for valet parking where we aren't seeing valet parking being done you know, on Old Green Bay and, and uh, um, you know, over by Hubbard Woods School and places like that, right? So you, I think you that- You mean in terms of where they're parking? Where they're parking, gotcha. right. I think, we need to, I think we need to make sure that we are um, defining both where the parking is allowed as well as you know, what is the penalty if it is not abided by. So I think that that's something that we as a village want to make sure that if there are people coming and parking at the, at the, you know, for these events, that they're parking in kind of the basic downtown area. I think that there's plenty of available parking that that can happen. I think we will also see um, many people coming with ride sharing services. So, you know, I don't think you're going to be pulling in 150 cars that have to be parked. It's, you know, um, but I think with those caveats, I, you know, I feel that we can make this work. I think, you know, I, I do want to see some sound solutions or solutions for the sound. Uh, um, and I hope you can get creative on that because, you know, that, that is, especially for the, for the next door neighbors, I think, you know, the, the, you know, my primary concern. Yeah. And um, first off, um, I'm familiar with the, the venue downtown, and uh, I would echo some of the comments here that, you know, when, when you look at a, a project, like, project like this, I think um, it's incumbent on us to take into account um, who we're dealing with in, in part here as part of the decision making, and I would say that we're dealing with a fine a fine business to start with um, and yes we're not the West Loop there's no doubt about that when that goes when but we are starting off base level here with a good proprietor I think and uh, at least from my experience and from what I've heard about the venue downtown and um, with a business concept that I agree um, you know there will be local demand for this and so it's not like we are talking about um, a, a business that that's um, you know likely to not be received I think it's quite the opposite I think there is a void here for this type of venue and so we're talking about a building six years empty for whatever reason and um, to trustee Wedner's point um, you know we sometimes have to think out of the box here and, and balance competing concerns on the other hand um, I do have a concern that the residents are heard and satisfied on this. And I think the village, um, in this particular case, has a real obligation, um, if we approve this in whatever form or, or fashion it would be approved, um, to monitor it, to enforce it, and to review it. Um, we've just recently, in recent meetings, we've talked about um, people that come to the podium with ideas and promises and so on, and then we don't follow up and monitor it. Um, this is one where we owe it, I think, to the residents to make sure that whatever construct we come up with um, that, that we feel might, might be workable um, is adhered to and that it works. And I don't know if there's some kind of annual review process that can be formalized in something like this, Peter, but um, I don't feel it would be right to just let this go forward and say, you know, 
it's fine as is and we just leave it at that. Um, and I don't think it's fair also just to leave it on the staff to monitor it. I think that, you know, we've got the, the police department that would be monitoring it. We have staff and it should in some way, for good or for bad, come back for review um, to make sure that, that we're not um, imposing too terribly on the neighbors. Um, and it is true that sometimes these things come up when it's in their backyard and that's when people become uh, most interested. And I will say this, that we did review this in January. We did review it in February. So it's not, there's no reason really to think um, that this has been sort of on the down low. Um, this has been a topic going on for several months now. Um, and now it's just kind of coming to fruition and to a certain extent. But from my standpoint, I agree. Um, what was said previously, we need to solidify this noise issue more than what we have right here. I mean, you said it, Scott, you said it. I think everyone is, agrees on that. Um, and then I, 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 there has to be oversight on this in some form or fashion, I think, um, if there is an approved um, you know, resolution here in some form. I know you look like you have something else to say. Oh, uh, yeah, I was just asking questions previously, so I don't know if we're moving to the wrap-up summary or what we think. Yeah, I mean, or, I think or, we or should. Or should we talk about the liquor ordinance first? I don't know. Well, so here, I'll give you a preview of what we have ahead of us yet. <laughs> we have a, a couple of points on the liquor ordinance with our chief of police. Um, we have the um, Mayor's Caucus Greenest Region, which is going to be a really good presentation we want to give time to. And just to, so everyone is assured, we don't jam things through. This is up for discussion for exactly what has happened tonight so that everybody can come speak so we can hear. We don't like pretend to listen and then just do whatever we're going to do. We listen. It's going to be held open for discussion to the next meeting, May 7th. Um, so no one should have a panic attack at the same time that um, uh, we'll continue working with boutique bites and staff, right? And, and so this is not like uh, you know, some last minute deal so everyone can take a breath, you know. Um, and thank you for all the work you've done. Now, if you do have additional discussion, keeping in mind we probably have a couple hours to go yet. I understand. Uh, and I've drank way too much water for that, so I'm just going to throw that out there. But talk as long as you want. If I start bouncing up and down. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, there are a a couple of things I think we need to address. One is um, the issue of why, as a council, we're talking about this rather than sending it through the special use process. Um, the, the issue here is that the particular use was in no way described in our ordinance. And so we, we had the issue of trying to figure out how to have this described within our um, permitted uses. So. Um, we're kind of taking on the special use process here and defining it and inserting an ordinance that would make this acceptable or, or possible um, in the village. So going forward, once it's described and um, a permitted use in some fashion, it would then <clears throat> um, go through the special use process. But right now, there just isn't any, isn't that correct? There just isn't a, a, a method for it to even be considered. Um, so. It's not that we're trying to go around the process. There just isn't any way to put it through the process right now. So um, um, that is why we have to consider so many different ordinances, because it is a very different kind of a use, and it touches on a lot of, um, of different aspects of what we regulate in the village. So that's why we're spending a lot of time talking about it at the council level. We want to hear from residents. Um, I agree with with the um, concern that has been brought up about how we communicate, um, and I, it doesn't, it's not just per pertinent to this particular issue, but just in general, how we communicate what we're considering, um, the fact that you're right, because this isn't a special use um, process, we have not put up that big sign, which would normally be done to alert people about what the conversation that we're having. Um, um, and also that we describe it in terms that is not so legalistic and people can actually understand what it is that's, that is um, going to be addressed. So um, I wanted to clarify that point. Um, I um, also would like, because we were talking about as we have 
the valet process put together, the parking process put together, I would like to request that actually it comes back. Um, I think it's important that we review it because I think there are a lot of considerations um, that I want to make sure that people have the opportunity to hear and understand um, before it's, it's finally approved. Um, I think that the issue of how the valet's drivers act in our very crowded downtown in the summer is, is a point of important consideration, and I want everybody to feel like we have a process that we can control. Um, so, and, and as well as the point about um, where the parking goes. The problem, of course, we always, we've been talking for years about wanting to have more restaurants and that being such an important aspect um, of keeping our community vital. And so now that we actually have restaurant type uses that want to come in, you know, this is, this is a good problem to have. But the question is, um, how, do we, how do we accommodate everybody safely? Um, um, so I think it's important that we think about with the spirit elephant that's coming in, where are all their, park are their parkers going, um, that we have a plan and not just leave it to happen willy-nilly. Um, and to Scott's point, to make sure, everybody's point, to make sure it doesn't spill out into the neighborhoods. Um, so again, I think specificity is to everybody's benefit. Um, um, so those are the two aspects that I hope we continue talking about at the council level. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And you know what I left off the list, and this is going to be really helpful given what I said about drinking a lot of water. We have a water study. We're going to. Oh well, there we go. We're going to hear about. <laughs> okay. So, uh, any other discussion? Um, otherwise, we're going to. Hold so it. I'm sorry. So the next steps, just for everybody here, we'll be back on May the seventh. On May the seventh. Correct. We'll continue the discussion. And then, in terms of when we begin to actually consider ordinances, either amending ordinances, uh, or yeah. uh, maybe you can just lay out what the schedule is. Right? Sure. So um, May 7th, it also dependent upon um, the applicant to provide us information from her architect, because I'm, everyone's interested in that in terms of soundproofing. Um, so the draft ordinances, or excuse me, resolution and ordinances would be on the agenda for your consideration on the 7th. Um, they could be uh, reviewed and or approved at that time, but if there's more discussion, it could also extend further uh, into, the, into the month or into future months, depending. I know she has a timeline that she'd like to meet, but you could take action on the 7th or you could take action on the next one or two meetings. And, and just to clarify one point, so on the resolution, we don't need to do an introduction, right. Correct. Um, but on the ordinance, we do need to do an introduction. It's not an approval, it's an introduction. So I would... One is the parking regulation, uh, um, regulations, that's MC3 2019, and the other one is amending the liquor code to create the new liquor class, Which that's MC4 2019. Those are just introductions, not five. The chief will talk about that, but yeah. maybe before we get to that, look, why don't we tackle MC3 2019, and I'll entertain a motion for introduction. So moved. Um, second. And then a question. Okay. Um, we can, even though we've moved and seconded it, we can continue to enter amendments to it at the next meeting. So Correct. as we Absolutely. get additional information back about daily parking passes and valet standards, we can then amend it at the next meeting. Yes. Correct. Okay. So roll call vote. Excuse me. Voice a second. Um, voice vote. Voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Um, no. Penny stepped up. Do we need you to have, wait? You have four votes. We have four votes. No. Okay. You can ask her when she gets back. Yeah. If she wanted to vote on that, so the record can be clear. Okay. It was all my talk about the water. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's go to the. Um, uh, we will now move to. This is related, but um, separate. So uh, we're, we're going to discuss ordinance number MC four twenty nineteen amending the liquor code to create a class Y. Ordinance MC4-2019 amends Winnicka's Liquor Code to add a classification for the operation of a banquet and reception hall along with a specialty food store. Here to review is Police Chief Mark Hornstein. Good evening, Council. So with respect to liquor, uh, some months back when we initially met with the applicant and we reviewed the proposed business model and, and what it is that she wanted to do, 
we went into our code and uh, reviewed it, and, and we do have a really robust uh, code with respect to liquor. We, have, we do have 17 different classifications of licenses. The problem is for what the applicant wants to achieve here, we don't have one that will meet these needs. So uh, I worked closely with the village attorney on this, and in looking at the description of uh, her proposal, uh, we came up with this new license proposal, code amendment, which would be a Class Y license. And the Class Y will essentially cover all three components of what the applicant is wishing to do. Uh, number one, the banquet and reception hall. Uh, number two, the specialty food store, meaning the cafe, if you will. And then last is the uh, beverage shop. It will allow for the authorization of retail sale and service of alcoholic beverages amongst all three of those elements or aspects of the businesses. Uh, if there should be a, a code amendment that passes, uh, we have received a, a liquor license application from the applicant. And if that were to, uh, if that resolution were to pass, that would be contingent upon uh, us completing her background investigation, final inspection of the premises, of course, and a certificate of occupancy. So with that, I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Great, um, why don't we do this? Um, begging that you please don't repeat comments or discussion from before. If you have any uh, additional comments or questions relevant to the liquor code uh, that is just up for introduction, not for adoption, just introduction, um, I'd open that up to the public now. Um, we'll start on the left. Please step up. Uh, Maureen Block, 814 Prospect. Can you clarify, do other liquor licenses in town go till midnight or 1 a.m. on New Year's Eve? I can't, but. Yeah, that's, <laughs> if you could just talk to sure. that, that would be helpful because I don't know any of that stuff. Thank you. So right now for businesses that have uh, in, the, in the Class A the Class A classifications of licenses, so generally restaurants or restaurants and or bar services are allowed to serve alcohol until uh, midnight. There are exceptions such as New Year's Eve where they can go till I believe it's 1 a.m., but for the Class A ones, it's midnight. Thank you, Chief. Uh, anyone else on the left side? Okay, moving to the right side. Anyone on the right side? I love you people. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, we'll bring it to the council for any discussion. I just thank you, Mark and Peter, for um, putting this together and being consistent with what already exists in the village. Thank you. Anyone else? No. Okay. Uh, so on this one, may I have a motion to introduce ordinance number MC4-2019? So moved. And a second? Second. Uh, voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, so it passes. Okay, uh, next uh, is resolution number R39, 2019, approving a Class Y liquor license for four boutique bites. This is for information only. Um, so finally, in conjunction with the foregoing amendment to the liquor code, which was just introduced, the subject resolution that we're about to hear about would approve a new Class Y liquor license for boutique bites subject to conditions which the police chief will review. We kind of do that already. Yep. Yeah. So, so this is just informational. So, um, yeah. Any additional comments or questions from the audience on the liquor code? Okay. Uh, council. Well, that was fast. Okay. Um, so this will be presented for adoption or on May seventh with everything else or further discussion. So that's what we're doing. All right, Brian. Are you still here? <laughs> okay the boutique bite stuff is over that's the, the, directly from our work for the evening thank you all very much please don't feel obligated to stay to hear about the water study but the it's really interesting the greenest region really interesting. Uh, region is interesting but um um, I think you, you should stay for the water study because, you know, it is an important thing that our village is doing to make things more efficient and better, more cost effective for all of us by helping and working with a neighboring Good. town. Okay. So I'd encourage you to stay. 
We don't like being alone. It's like pressure. You can, you can go seriously. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so Rob, why don't you get us kicked off? Sure. Um, I'll will set you up here a little bit, Brian. Um, over the last few years, the village managers in the area get together on a regular basis to look for opportunities where we can share services and reduce our cost of, of doing business uh, at the same time maintaining very high service levels to our community. Um, the most recent, probably the most uh, significant was the um, consolidation of police dispatching where Glencoe, uh, Northfield and Kenilworth and Winnetka combined with Glenview and that process took about a year and a half and there's a a certain amount of bandwidth that we have to devote to these things. And the next piece with Glencoe was the fire inspection services, the sharing agreement there to take on their, their work. With respect to this project, um, this study or these discussions have been going on informally for about a year, year and a half, looking at our opportunities, looking at how to set this up, um, the staff sharing baseline data with each other. And we finally got to the point where we realized that we needed some uh, professional assistance and uh, the vendor that we're looking at is one that has familiarity with both of our systems. So at this point, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Brian to uh, further explain it. Can I rest my case with that? Just sure, if you'd like to. If you'd like to. No. So uh, as uh, Village Manager Ban uh, articulates, we've been meeting with uh, Glencoe. There's no formal agreement in place. Right. And uh, we got to the point where uh, further technical analysis is uh, desired to look at the feasibility of a combined water system. Uh, with no predetermined uh, answer on what that's going to look like or what it could pose. Uh, we've, as we're talking through that and, and looking at how we would accomplish that, it was quickly came to light that both utilities have used Strand Associates and they've, they actually have done work for both our water plants and also hydraulically modeled our water systems for other projects that the two municipalities have, uh, use them for professional services. So collaboratively we put together a list of items that we want them to look, and I say collaboratively, it was uh, the Winneka side, working with our peers in Glencoe, village manager, and the senior staff of the water organization on my side. And Strand uh, put a proposal together to address our what we asked them to look at, which is included in your packet as, exhibit, as an exhibit. Uh, and at a high level, they're going to look at our two water plants individually. They're going to look at a conceptual arrangement of water plants they're going to look at hydraulic analysis of our system so when they're interconnected how they act, interact some of the things that you know you don't think about is we operate our water systems at different pressures so now you try to operate them as a combined system uh, now you've got to be able to address that and how what's what's the impact on one community or another they're going to look at uh, our emergency interconnects i think we all take comfort in knowing we have emergency interconnects but this will also give us a sense of how well they would function for each of the two communities if we were called upon to use them There'll be some uh, statements of probable cost will be developed, and there's also inclusion of board presentations to both Glencoe and, and Winneka. This is expected to go on for a better part of at least a year, and the project cost, uh, the total project cost is uh, right now at 69910 and what's before you is a cost sharing agreement with Glencoe. Glencoe would actually contract with Strand Associates. It's being discussed maybe a little earlier tonight. Um, but at their board <laughs> meeting tonight, um, and what we're asking your permission to do is uh, to reimburse them for up to 50% of the services. So that would be an amount not to exceed 34955 In the water fund budget, we did budget $30,000 for an interconnection study. And because this will cross over the calendar year or our fiscal year, I don't see uh, a need for an offset at this point in time with the work expected to go in. But that is also a precursor that we would be budgeting some remaining funds in the next year's 2020 budget. Uh, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions, but the resolution prepared by the village council, village attorney, excuse me, would authorize a cost sharing agreement with Glencoe, contingent on obviously them entering into a contract with Strand Associates. Thanks, Brian. Any, any trustee questions while Brian's up there? Okay, we'll come back for discussion, but I'm going to open it up to the audience for any comments or questions. What happened to the room? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> they're all flooding into the street now. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, any further council discussion? I think what you're hearing is we really like this. <laughs> Good job, really, both of you. That's yeah, to think, outstanding. Uh, 
manager band and his peer for uh, yeah. getting us in the room together. So yeah, no, this is exactly the kind of thing that towns in Illinois should be doing. So thank you. Um, can I have a motion to adopt resolution R43 2019? So moved. Sorry, there's a motion. Yeah, uh, a second. Second. Roll call vote. Trustee Wedner? Yes. Trustee Craig? Yes. Trustee Myers? Yes. Trustee Dearborn? Yes. Trustee Lamphere? Yep. Um, Brian, I'm sorry. Uh, when is the when is this when we, will we be expecting the uh, the report on this? So it'll be 2020. So they, well, they're expecting a year. So from when we launch it, it was okay. be probably May of 2020 at the earliest. May of 2020. Okay. Right. I'll Thanks, Brian. Okay. Next, uh, old business. None. New business. The Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus Greenest Region Compact Two, also known as the GRC2. Following the Council's adoption of the GRC2, the Environmental and Forestry Commission was directed to review the goals of the compact to determine which objectives are appropriate for when I could pursue. Tonight, Commissioner Liz Kunkel will review the EFC's recommendations based on their in-depth review. Take it away, Liz. Thanks, Andy. Ed, sorry. I know. This is, this is what we're used to. This is about right. Um, sorry, I'm just going to check this. Okay, great. So um, I want to say, first of all, that although I'm doing the presentation, I'm obviously speaking on behalf of the EFC collectively. This was absolutely a group effort. Um, and it was, it was collaborative, not just within the EFC, but it was, uh, it was uh, President Rents who actually helped get this going. It started with an informal conversation. I had an extra copy of this framework document. He honestly originally said, no, I don't need it. You just tell me about it later. And he's like, you got an extra copy, just give it to me. And th that's how things happen. So we, um, um, uh, we, uh, we presented to the council last year. Um, sorry, before I even get to that, sorry. Also fundamental to this process was Matt Havlick, our staff liaison. He uh, is the core of this um, and his understanding of all of these different elements and the work he's put into all of this working through the framework is cannot be overstated. So thank you for getting us to where we are, Matt. Um, oh, and sorry, and um, our chair, uh, Chuck Dowding, um, would have been here, but he was conflicted out. He's traveling back tonight. He still may show up. You never know. Um, you never know which, you never know which, he's going to try to, but, um, but I don't know what the plans are. So anyway, just, it's my name, but it's not my presentation. I am just the voice for the, for the commission. So a real quick overview, I'm going to kind of mush the first few slides together. Timeline, process, status, suggestions, plans, recommendations. We want to talk a little bit about how we got here, what our suggestions are, and, and what we think the steps should be moving forward. So again, as Andy, uh, uh, as Trustee Kripe summarized, we, um, we, uh, we, on behalf of the EFC, we presented to the Village Council last year. The, the Council adopted or endorsed uh, the, the GRC2, or the Genius, uh, sorry, Greenest Region 2 Compact. It is this municipal pledge. It articulates high-level goals. Um, it's a very comprehensive tool. It is literally a, um, an Excel document. It consists of a 424 line items. Um, that are either goals or strategies for improving sustainability. Um, I want to mention one thing real quick. When we presented last year, um, the number that we were talking about was about 1,100 line items in the GRC2, and that might kind of ring a bell for some of you. We realized as we were going through it that, that the 1,100 number is actually the number of line item uh, goals or strategies that were contained within the 39 or so local and regional plans that the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus reviewed, and then they distilled those down to the 424 that are in the framework. So we, as, a, as the commission, worked through those less than 500 items, not more than 1,000 for, for context. And then those items are divided for, um, for ease of discussion and understanding into 10 categories, namely climate, economic development, energy, land, leadership, mobility, municipal operations, sustainable communities, waste, and recycling, and water. And last uh, March, the council requested that we work through the framework, that we report back in the fall with the report suggestions and plans. And uh, as the third bullet point notes, it took longer than we thought. It took a year um, to work through it all, even though it was less than half of what we expected. That's just how long it took. 
So um, I'm actually going to jump to slide five um, to give a little more history. So basically, since last year, we spent the next six months working through those individual line items in each category. Basically, each commissioner was tasked with one or two sections of the framework to work through it so that we could try to identify um, all of these line items are um, were, were listed in um, sort of status fashion, if you will, in terms of whether they've been accomplished, are actively being pursued, or short-term goals, long-term goals, not on the horizon at all, don't not interested or not relevant kind of thing. So each one of us worked through each of our sections to try to identify each line item where it fell on that spectrum um, and, and, and how we could uh, provide evidence to the extent we think something is in the works or completed um, and how to sort of keep track of things that may be not on the horizon but we didn't want to lose track of. So that, that was sort of the process we worked through. Um, and then uh, at the beginning back in November 2018 and through early, early 2019, we basically drilled down and each commissioner came up with sort of a top 10 list um, across all categories for what we thought was either important or frankly easier for the village to adopt. We didn't want to just sort of pick arbitrary things that weren't on any horizons and say let's go for this. So um, we, we looked at it um, sort of um, openly just to see what we thought was important, but we also looked at it a little bit strategically to see what made sense for the village to pursue. Um, and then again, we worked through that, um, and Matt helped a great deal combining all these ideas. There is some overlap between the different categories. You know, an issue might come up in, in a couple of the different 10 categories, so we worked hard to, to again, distill those further into a, a workable number um, and sort of scope of, of items to consider. Uh, and then we worked with the staff. Um, Matt and, um, and Steve Saunders were instrumental, and Brian, and so many people gave input on how to structure this and how to think about it. So the current GRC2 framework, uh, which is that Excel spreadsheet, and it's part of the agenda materials tonight, it, it basically contains the current sort of status of what we believe uh, is the village's um, um, action or, uh, uh, you know, sort of... Um, Perspective, not perspective, but you know what what action the village has taken on each of these items, if any. So, so the framework last year when we talked about it, it was blank. This year, it's it's completed basically, um, and then the presentation, the goals that we're going to talk about, we basically identified three goals of the 10 in the framework um, and, and want to present them in the overarching philosophy of thinking globally while acting, acting and executing locally. Um, that's really important for the whole uh, process, we think. So I'm going to go back up to slide four because this uh, great pie chart that Matt created shows um, in, in, in really nice visual form the status of all these different items, whether we'd achieve them, they're in progress, again, six month horizon, 12 to 18 month, et cetera. So it sort of shows where we fall. Um, that information is also presented um, in, in more of a table format in the memorandum that goes in the, in the packet materials, um, which starts on page 224 uh, of the agenda. Um, it's more of a, uh, like I said, a chart that sort of walks through, um, you know, so for example, in climate, we, uh, under the category of climate, we identified that we've achieved three of the items in that individual category. Um, so there's a nice summary. Uh, the, the, the total number at the bottom of that chart is what's reflected um, in the uh, in the uh, pie chart in the uh, uh, in the PowerPoint, but there's a little more context and depth for it in the memorandum that accompanies it. So, um, and then for moving forward, we want to keep, as I said, keep work, uh, working within the GRC2 framework, focus on our big priorities that we're going to recommend tonight, but, but consider uh, continue working within the framework um, more generally um, as other ideas and issues uh, uh, kind of rise to the surface. Um, we'll continue to, we basically want the framework to be an active document. You know, it will con it's not going to be static. It's not going to be just a snapshot. It's going to be um, continued to, again, guide us and, and filled out as we work toward things. Um, and obviously, we'll use it uh, specifically as directed by the council um, and specifically want to make sure it's integrated into the EFC's webpage. Um, on a short-term basis to uh, provide access and information and be a resource uh, for people in our community and outside of the community looking, looking in, um, and, and as well as uh, having the framework items be potentially integrated into the various strategic plans, uh, both of the EFC and, and potentially of the village um, at large. So um, our, our, our 
our big three recommendations are basically in the categories of waste, water, and energy. Um, and we, we thought about it a little bit as a um, sort of a, again, sort of with this framework of acting globally but thinking sorry, thinking globally and acting and executing locally, that we're, we're all at base talking about making some individual changes, but those have effect at the village level, which then have effect on the community and, and larger level. So starting from sort of the most individual action um, on the waste front, so we, we, we would like the council to pursue policies and actions that contribute to sustainable material management and help reduce consumption, increase use of reusable materials and products, increase recycling and waste diversion, including specifically food scrap collection, and decrease the amount of waste overall and what's sent to landfill specifically. Um, the, the slide that's waste priorities, um, we've chosen five priorities for the village uh, for the council to consider as sort of specific ways to move forward um, uh, the, the conversation of waste and reach some goals in the waste category. Um, what these, in the parenthetic, what we did is we were working through the, the different line items um, within, as the EFC, as the commissioners were working through the line items. Toward the end of the process, we, as we were drilling down to our top 10 lists, we were uh, identifying which of those actions or goals, strategies or goals um, that we were um, highlighting, sort of what, what actions would be required in connection with them? Would it be uh, the council proposing an ordinance, which is the PO uh, letters? Um, DS stands for direct staff to pursue something, and EFC is council directing the EFC to pursue something. So every item that we came up with, we tried to um, figure out where the interplay of those were. So that's what those parentheticals are, um, so that we can figure out where, where ordinances might be required, where st additional study is required, whether by staff and or EFC. And then the other letter number combinations refer to the, um, the specific line item within the GRC2 framework. So uh, the adopt a pay as you throw program um, would potentially require uh, an ordinance and staff direction, um, and it's identified as WR six, it's line item six in the waste and recycling category. So again, you'll see that some of these, a lot of these in the waste um, category are, are the WR within the waste and recycling category, but some of them are MO, which is municipal operations, and they might, you know, intersect. Can I just interject? So is our objective tonight to go through each of these and say, you know, we, we will take on pay as you throw, or for zero waste for public events, we want staff to calculate the cost. I mean, are, are, are we here to kind of decide? That, that was not our intent, no. No? No. So this is just. It, it, these are the ones within. Just, we would like. So, and then okay. have this at a working session at some point to kind of right. talk through in more detail. Absolutely. Yeah. There, there, there'll Jack, be are a, you listening? <laughs> Jack, are you listening? There'll, there'll be, there'll be a, sort of a <laughs> summation of next steps uh, towards the end. Right. We so. just, these are the highlights within the waste category that we think are the ones the village should focus on. And no, we are not looking for a discussion or a decision on those, just a general sort of acknowledgement that these are the ones we think are the priorities the village should consider pursuing, uh, again, upon further uh, discussion and study. Um, so the ones we think within the waste category are the important priorities to pursue are to adopt a pay-as-you-throw program, to continue uh, supporting and incentivizing recycling services. And we know some of this is going on, again, already. We just want to specify that this is a true uh, priority for the village. Um, specifically on the fronts of, of improving access for commercial and multifamily recycling um, access, discouraging the use of unrecyclable and hard to recycle materials, um, et cetera. Uh, as, the, as, uh, as Mary and uh, um, Allison touched on in their presentation, and as I mentioned in the public comment earlier, making public events zero waste, uh, which does not mean no waste, but a conscious effort to reduce waste, is a, is an effort, is a, is a way the village can have, I think, a, a big impact on reducing its, uh, its footprint. 
uh, for those events. Um, and then municipal financing practices um, being consistent and um, one of the big issues was making sure that any cost savings that might come about from a result of, of any of these initiatives be um, you know, potentially reinvested uh, to additional environmental initiatives as opposed to general fund purposes, things like that. But again, that's for further discussion. But those are the priorities within the waste category. Within the water category, big picture, looking for um, policies and actions that use and distribute water efficiently and sustainably, protect and improve water quality, and optimize the use of natural and built systems to manage stormwater, all while improving the habitability of Winnetka. The priorities within that category, um, again, which are being discussed and acted on already, but with a little more specificity, include protecting the surface and groundwater from runoff and contamination, supporting post-development runoff reduction and mitigation, um, and encouraging residents and businesses to address flood risks, risks on their properties, um, as well as collaborating with other organizations, both within Winnetka and, and um, outside regionally, um, inter-community uh, cooperation and discussions, um, and then, uh, again, potentially adopting codes um, to address some of that more specifically. And then within the energy category, um, this is more of the bigger picture sort of global effect on things. Um, uh, we're looking to uh, pursue policies and actions to help redu reduce greenhouse gases, promote energy efficiency, and reduce energy uses, so usage overall, develop renewable sources of energy, and engage the villa village community in sustainability and clean energy practices to adapt to and mitigate the effects of climate change. Uh, and the, category, the priorities within that are to adopt uh, energy efficient measures for village facilities, um, to again look to make some changes across other village functions, re develop renewable energy resources, um, especially on underutilized properties currently, um, such as the landfill space, some rooftop spaces, things like that. Um, and then support the adoption of renewable energy technologies, especially those that positively impact economic development in the village. Um, and, help, and or help residents um, access alternative energy options. So our proposed work plan, the conclusion is that we would like the council to consider incorporating specifically elements of the GRC2 as we've tailored them through this review for Winnetka, ultimately into, into Winnetka's comprehensive plan. And again, we're not looking for a yes on that right now, but that's what we're, that's the goal. We know that's also a, you know, a longer term process, but that's the way to really um, uh, uh, confirm and and guarantee that these priorities are are actually going to be explicit and and will actually guide village thinking and action in the future. So our our the first uh, first aspect uh, of the work plan is to ultimately get some of these GRC two items incorporated into the comprehensive plan as that's revised. Number two is um, incorporating uh, uh, those elements of the framework, again, as tailored specifically for Winnetka, into the EFC's strategic plan, which was drafted back in 2009 to 2010. Um, and we think the GRC2 framework provides the best opportunity for really updating and, and um, refining that, that original strategic plan um, and, and bringing it more current. And then we uh, request policy direction on whether the EFC may begin and or continue pursuing these three recommended priorities, namely waste, water, and energy. Um, and then uh, obviously we intend to follow up, provide regular status reports to the council and the community at large regarding the progress made, any goals that are um, stated and deadlines that are required. So our recommendation, our request is that the council basically provide the EFC with policy direction on proceeding with the proposed work plan um, on the prior slide. Again, trying to keep it really big picture, but give you some specific ideas of what we're looking at to pursue down the road. So, thanks. Thanks, Liz. So I'll open it up for questions, discussion. Can I? Yeah. So, uh, Liz, you know, this is amazing what you're doing. And uh, of course, I love all of this because I'm right there with you on the environment and how important it is. and and our ability locally to have a real impact on how we all live. You know, I, I think it is such a gigantic task, and, you know, the detail that you have is obviously where all of the change is going to come from, but it's overwhelming. And it's overwhelming for staff, you know. So the idea is how do we actually make this a reality? And I guess my hope would be is that you could, I don't know how you would do this without using a lot of staff time. 
So it, but we need to have some kind of cost associated with making the change, cost or return on investment. It can't just be that we have this list of things that are good to do. And, and as you're looking at cost and, and return on investment, you know, over the long term, like a 10-year period, because right. immediately it may require investment, but long term, there would be some kind of, you know, greater return on it. Because otherwise, I just, I get afraid that we're going to have a lot of, you know, David's time, and he's already cloning himself, uh, you know, trying to achieve these kinds of things. It's, it's overwhelming, and yet we want to do them. And so then I think in terms of the village, you know, I wonder if we would want to have an environmental audit ourselves where we go through and look at these things that you've put together, and even a day or a half day like we do with the budget where we put this aside because we know how important it is and not try and do it late at night when we're all exhausted, but like, you know, a morning meeting, 9 to 12, you know, something like that where we can all be fresh and think about it and really try and integrate it. I think this work is so important, but when it comes at 9.30 at night, you know, it doesn't get what it deserves, and we don't have the information that we need to make any kind of intelligent decisions about policy or direction. So money is super important in all of this and costing it out, and, it, you know, so all that is super important. But thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> kind of along that line, I mean, there are, there are a continuum of things here in terms of readiness to, to, to take action on, right? Adopt a pay-as-you-throw program is something that, you know, we looked at three years ago. We're ready to kind of have a presentation and, and decide as a council, are we going to do this in this village or not? Something like making public events zero waste, I think pretty quickly we could estimate what the cost of that is. I mean, I did a kind of a rough thumbnail sketch for the Music Fest, and you know, forgetting about com compostable utensils and plates, just the service that we would have to contract to make this happen would be about $3,000. So, I mean, for the 4th of July, and you know, we could come up with that cost and then say, all right, in our next budget for, for next year, is that something we want to put in the budget? So, so some of that's relatively simple. Some of these um, rain, you know, rain barrels and, and, and enabling harvesting of rainwater, I think that's, you know, EFC could make a recommendation. You know, we should identify a vendor and let residents know where they can buy this. But some of these others, I'm not sure I even understand the impact, ensure municipal finance practices are consistent with sustainability and reinvest cost savings into sustainable initiatives. Well, I'm not sure that we as a village should commit to saying any savings we get from putting in new LED lighting should go back in. You know, there, it's taxpayer dollars. We've got to look at uh, other uses. So I think there are some, some pros and cons. And then on the energy priorities, you know, Supporting adoption of renewable energy technologies, I'm not, I'm not even sure what we would do there. So, you know, to your point, I think having more insight on some of these more complex things of what, what could we really do, I think is important, right? So there's, I would say some are, are easy in terms of information is easy to get and it's easy to put it in front of this council to make a decision. Some of these, I think, maybe require some clarification, and then, you know, we can make some decisions. I think there are some that are, are pretty complicated, and I'm not sure exactly what, what we can do around implementing renewable energy sources here at the village level. I, it would require a lot of study. Um, what is that? Uh, it, it, would that be part of the directive to the EFC, that we would yeah. want them to flush out the pros and cons, carrot and stick, cost implications. Is that what we'd be asking the EFC so to do? Having been the liaison to the EFC, I'll um, maybe answer and then turn yeah. over to Liz. Um, you're all absolutely right. There's a lot here and there's a lot to think about. The amount of work the EFC has done has been incredible to distill kind of like here are some possible priorities. The ask tonight, though, is let's not discuss all that because each of these could in its own right deserve a study session. I mean, there's a lot there. Yeah. So the ask tonight, and I think this is the really important part, is can, that the council should consider incorporating elements 
into the overall comprehensive plan. And that's obviously something we'd want to ask the EFC to help provide against. There's a lot more to discuss and develop here. You're right, you know, there's going to be cost elements, and th that's all part of it. Each of these things is a meaty topic, but I think the critical thing is we've got a dedicated team of people that are sort of crystallizing, here's what you've done, here's where there's opportunities, and they're teeing it up for us so that we can have that discussion, and that's pretty awesome. The amount of work is just stunning that it takes to do that, and they're going to keep it on the radar, and I, I really love the idea, too, of like the, you know, we do a budget review every year. Maybe there should be an environmental review every year, but... So I think these are the right three areas. I think yeah, these are the, absolutely, and that's one of the things that came out. Energy out the right clear. three, yeah, and the fact that they've pulled some sub points out, I think, are the right way to go. Yeah, and some I do think are closer to you know taking action on, but then I would agree. Let's let's continue to keep pushing forward on the other ones and clarify what it means. And that's why we included them in there again, again to try to identify the ones that might be low hanging fruit that we can act quickly, but ones that also dovetail with that or kind of piggyback on that, or again, more like energy. We figured ener waste and water are the easy ones in the village, not easy, but they were easy from the perspective of we know action and discussion is already happening on them, uh, on those issues specifically. Energy, not so much, but we think it's important, right. and so that's why it became our top third. We also think it's especially relevant for Winneka because we're in such a unique situation because of owning our own power plant. It creates some unique challenges, but also some unique opportunities, and this is the time to be thinking about those for lots of reasons. So even though we know it's longer and it's more vague, again, we're not saying sign off on you know waste to energy, but but as a big picture priority, let's delve into it more and figure out some of those specifics and those cost structures. And yes, that's the direction that we'd like back, and we're not asking for sign off on every one of the line items, but um, approval, acknowledgement of the big three um, categories, priorities, um, or goals, I guess, and categories as the sort of stated priorities, and then hopefully we can work to figure out which of those Sub sub items are the ones that we can work toward more quickly, and which are again prioritize those effectively. Well, actually, um, in light of the work that the council and the village staff, you know, the initiatives that we're working on right now, um, together with the goals that you have, I, I don't know if you can like prioritize your priorities, but obviously with the different, you know, stormwater and water initiatives that are going on now or will be going on um, together with what we're doing, um, you know, relative to our, all our waste um, systems uh, pick up and so forth. If you could focus your work for the time being so that your work dovetails with what the council is doing so that we can get all these initiatives coming together at the same time. I agree with you that the energy is really important, but um, that's a longer term um, issue. And so if we can focus right now on what's going on, what we can accomplish over the next couple of years, um, and not forgetting the energy, but that being a longer term process, that, you know, I think that would be, that would be really helpful. I mean, I think it would be using everybody's resources and time and effort right. effectively. Right. And if I may, we talked about that a little bit at our last EFC meeting, and we, we, and we honestly, as you can tell, we struggled with the ask. It, it was hard to figure out what to ask for, how to be specific enough without putting you too much on the hook, but how not to be too vague, but get some, get some traction on some things. Um, and on the energy piece, and specifically all of them in connection with the comp plan, potentially, or again, whether it's the EFC strategic plan or the, or the village's comp plan, both of those are going to potentially take a longer term view to things. Um, and as you know, statewide, city, the city of Chicago, the state of Illinois, many other states and cities are, are taking pledges to reduce carbon emissions, to be zero waste, to shift to electric vehicles. And those are longer term goals, and they, they don't happen quickly. So you have to kind of start the process early. But people are articulating, you know, zero waste or carbon emissions free, or again, electric vehicles, pick one of them, by 2030, by 2040, by 2050. That's the kind of horizon it can take. And again, if we're looking at some something within the village, you know, considering how the power plant might come into play, obviously those are bigger discussions, but I don't feel like we can wait to start them. That's why we're all talking about this. 
know, just li everywhere we're all dealing with limited time in. Right, well, it, but also, I mean, again, even if we identify all three of these as a priorities, it doesn't mean they're all gonna be acted on immediately. I mean, you, you articulated it really well, Penny, that, that we, we tried, again, we chose water and waste potentially because it does dovetail with what the council's working on already. And there's traction there and we can build on that. And so those are the things that we think we can act on quickly. And as you say, we don't lose sight of energy, but I feel strongly that I hope it can still be stated as a, a priority, recognizing that it's longer term, which will, um, because the other issues of water and waste are already being considered, and frankly are more, it's easy to say they're more urgent. I mean, that's the thing that people more get. more tangible. Tangible, right. exactly. But, but again, in, our, in some people's minds, the issues of, big generally energy and reducing carbon put footprint are equally urgent. The whole problem is you, it's not immediate, but that's the whole issue is getting people to understand potentially that there is some urgency there. But yes, that we would focus more on the waste and water as the, as the issues that are really being acted on and um, need to be addressed short, short term within the village. So uh, unless anyone has uh, any comment from the public, yes. Please, step on up. Julie, I see you sent all the scouts home. <laughs> yeah, I always have something to say. Um, just going back to energy, doesn't the village belong to sort of an energy consortium that burns coal to get its energy? Is that true? Yes. Yes. So, so the village is pursuing wonderfully all these sustainable, the, you know, the composting, the energy, the potential zero waste at some of the events. How can the village, um, you know, have one, on one hand, you're burning coal and emitting greenhouse gases, and on the other hand, committing to something more, you know, saying, yes, we're, we're, we're energy, or we're, we're environmentally forward, but yet you still have this coal burning footprint. Um, has the village, I don't know, it, you know, when you, when you, the contract with this group runs out, have, has the village looked at something like solar or wind going with a, that kind of, of energy group and what sort of, you know, put it out to the public, you know, hey, this might increase your taxes by whatever dollars, but is that something you'd want us to do? I mean, is that something the village would be willing to look at? So good points. And uh, as I said before, all of these things are big meaty topics that deserve their own time. But um, that is, so we have a long-term contract. Um, 20, when I say long-term, it's... Yeah, so the contract was entered into, I think, approximately 10 years ago. Um, a little bit prior to the issue or the more, you know, heightened attention to coal. I would note um, that as we're a member of the Illinois Municipal Electric Agency, their portfolio is not 100% coal. There are renewables in their portfolio now, and we're part owners of and, and a consumer are, are buying a power from wind farms. So the portfolio is evolving, and we expect that to happen as these as these coal operations wind down. So I think the trick is to, yes, acknowledge where we are now in terms of our overall portfolio, but you need to look at it with a long-term view to position yourself to be more sustainable. So at this point, it's, it's not there yet, but it's something I think the agency will be looking at, and we would probably be looking at a renewal with them probably around 2030. That's about the horizon. You, you don't wait till 2035 to do it. Yeah. Yep. Important question. items were there? Let's just say 400. 424. Uh, I was sitting here thinking, my God, if I were on the council, how would I decide among 424 possible good suggestions? Um, and I didn't come with an answer. Um, but off the top of my head and maybe off the wall, I was wondering if every, if all seven members of the council took a list, took the list of 424 and gave them a number from one to 10 and they're off the top view of which would be both doable and desirable and then see which ones have the highest number and then concentrate on that rather than saying, I think energy is more important than recycling or something like that. You know, keep it practical, desirable and doable and then so, focus on that. Uh, that's what the EFC did for a good part of a year. Yeah, well, now it's your turn. 
Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, because yeah, they did a good you've job. Got narrow, you've got to narrow it down from 424. And I sat in on most of those meetings. Oh. Uh, they did a very good job, and, and they've distilled it. And, and so now we need to look, how do we move forward? And, and so thank you for that comment. Yeah. Uh, and I think it recognizes, and I, I can't emphasize this enough, how much work went into this. And just so you all know, they didn't just go through the list and say, yeah, I kind of feel like we did that. I mean, this thing's got like citations and stuff. It's impressive. And it, uh, so, and it's funny, we, I think Liz and I are both laughing a little bit because kind of what you described is essentially what they did. That's what we did. He described it really well, though. Desirable yeah, it's and almost exactly Desirable what happened. and doable. He said it much better than I did. Yeah, That's what we so, were going for. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah, so that was a good suggestion a year late, but it was good. <laughs> no, <laughs> but it is, no, it's what happened, it is what happened. But again, actually, happened. what we did, Jeffrey, was that, that exactly that process of what you said, sort of the council should do, come up with your top 10, that is, that's how we came up with that big three list. Those were the ones that had the most, if you did like a smatter chart, those would be the big circles. And then it was all the other ones that were the little circles that were sort of maybe one person said it, but those were the ones that all of us had something you know that, that rose to the top of our list kind of a top three of ten sort of and if i may say real quick my understanding also was that a, the power plant was largely coal-fired and when i spoke with brian keys about it he corrected me and said it was actually came up at another meeting it was one of those kind of fortuitous i came walked into something i wasn't sure didn't know was going to happen and um it's largely um a natural gas actually the largest portion of the portfolio is natural gas not coal still it's still a non-renewable resource yeah. but it might be yeah. slightly preferable than coal to some people the coal, and there the is been gone for some the coal has been gone for some time so it is natural gas again still a non-renewable resource um and my understanding is that the the renewable energy portion of the portfolio is still pretty small and one of my big questions is how do we say we want more how do i mean how does the consortium push back and say we want more of those renewable energy sources. And again, and then Winnetka's in this very unique position because any of these, any there, there are trade-offs to being in the consortium or not. We could choose not to be in it and sort of be on our own and that would create a whole different thing. So there's lots of issues to consider there. So let me do this. Any other public comment? Here's what I suggest we do. I'm just gonna go through the four items and I just wanna quick yes, no, um, so that Liz and the EFC have some direction. Item number one was um, the EFC is requesting that we consider incorporating elements of the GRC2 into the comprehensive plan. Is that? Uh, Can I add just yeah. the, the um, on on our work plan and David's task list, and yet another one um, <laughs> is to uh, bring forth uh, work on the comp plan for this year. So I would see this as a, a later part of the year project. Everybody like that idea? As long as David can handle it. Well, and I think it would have to be the EFC. EFC would be yeah. contributing to that. A absolutely. And we'll make it manageable. We're not looking to overwhelm anybody. The context is it, we're not starting from scratch. It would be an update to the. Exactly. And we're not going to be, you know, throwing things at the wall and see what sticks. We'll, we'll do what makes sense and what's doable and desirable. Again, I'm going back with that. So that would be part of the new comprehensive plan. Is part of it. Yep. yep. Right. Everyone good? Okay. Number two, the EFC will incorporate elements of the GRC2 framework as tailored for Winneka through the EFC's review and analysis into the EFC's strategic plan so the EFC can continue bringing focus recommendations to the current and future councils. Everyone like that idea? Okay, that's a yes. All right. Um, number three, the EFC requests policy direction, <coughs> excuse me, on whether to begin and or continue pursuing the EFC's three recommended environmental priorities for the village, namely waste, water, and energy. And I think we've heard some discussion on that. And I, Penny, I agree with you the way you, I think water is number one, waste is number two, and energy is number three. Not that any of them are not important, but yeah. Mm -hmm. But just in terms of where we are, does everybody like that idea? Yeah. Okay, so it's a yes on that one. And then lastly, the EFC intends to provide regular status reports to the council and community on progress toward meeting the stated goals and deadlines assume we all like that idea yeah okay and so that i think is a yes on all of them and thank, thank you. you so much thank you guys. thanks for hanging out and thanks to all of you for, yeah thanks for hanging out yeah no but thanks for considering because again i know it's not easy it's a lot it is overwhelming i um one quick um aside we've been talking about big and one small thing um is when you're talking about the waste and the studies and whatever um 
the issue of contaminated product, um, mm. I don't know that we've talked about it or looked at it at all, but when you're looking at the different elements, if you could check into that, because I just, I wonder if we're doing a good enough job of educating our... In terms of recycling or yeah. food scrap? Well, recycling. right now, in terms of the program right. that we have, in terms of recycling. Yeah. Um, so I think I think that it's something that we, it, 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 it that's one of the sub-priorities yeah. within the priorities. We need, we all need to it, refine our recycling systems, and that involves a lot of education to... Yeah. Uh, inform people what the sort of standards are. So we, and one of the things we're going to do, we talked about getting the, um, the something I've thought about for a few years, and it sort of, sorry, hasn't happened. I, I always think about it at the wrong time, right? At the wrong time to, uh, to act on it, but is um, having the village's recycling guidelines included regularly as part of one of the hard copy Winneka reports that goes out each year so that the people who was every person who receives it has the recycling guidelines that has the standards and the whole reason that we created those a few years ago was so that people could have something like a quick resource to have available and stick on a bulletin board if people still have bulletin boards or you know have it taped to their wall because we know nobody's going to go to a, a, a computer and look on a website to find out what the list of what's recyclable. So trying to give them a handout. Um, but yet we know we need to do more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. All right. Appointments, none. Closed session, none. Adjournment. May I have a motion to adjourn? Second. All right. Voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah.